Orcs and goblins are supposedly one and the same thing in Tolkien, but he describes them quite differently in The Hobbit, where they are goblins, mostly, with only one or two orc references, and in The Lord of the Rings, where they are orcs, mostly, with only one or two goblin references. Here is what Tolkien says of goblins in The Hobbit, the goblins were very rough, and pinched unmercifully, and chuckled and laughed in their horrible stony voices. The goblins began to sing, or croak, keeping time with the flap of their flat feet on the stone, and shaking their prisoners as well. Now the goblins took out whips and whipped them with a swish, smack, and set them running as fast as they could in front of them. There in the shadows on a large flat stone sat a tremendous goblin with a huge head, and armed goblins were standing round him carrying the axes and the bent swords that they use. Now goblins are cruel, wicked, and bad-hearted. These wicked and bad-hearted goblins were the sort to eat ponies, to light fires and dance around them, and to complain about the savagery of the weapons used against them. Cruel as they were, they were drawn as caricatures for the sake of providing a terrifying amusement in the story. And except for the flat feet and the great goblin's huge head Tolkien never really provided a description of what the goblins looked like in The Hobbit. Some carried swords, and others carried spears. They wore helmets and used shields, too. Goblins were fond of fire and relied on torches in their caverns, so they don't seem to have been very good at seeing in the dark. We meet the orcs in the Fellowship of the Ring when the Company of the Ring is trapped in the chamber of Mazarbul in the ancient dwarf city Hazadum, Moria. The scene is very dark and somber as the company has just found the tomb of Balin and Gandalf has finished reading the book of Mazarbul which ends with the ominous words, the end comes, drums, drums in the deep. They are coming. These words send chills up many a reader's spine, for the hopeless situation of Balin's folk has been underscored by the bones lying around his tomb. Balin's tomb copyright copyright Ankemen. Used by permission. And then the orcs come again, beating their drums. These orcs laugh in a hoarse manner, like the fall of sliding stones into a pit. Gandalf looks out at the orcs and tells his companions, some are large and evil, black Uruks of mortar. Some people have taken this sentence to mean that not all orcs were black-skinned. The orcs of Moria used bows and scimitars, no bent swords here. They also made use of horns and drums, and had rams and hammers ready for the onslaught on the chamber of Mazarbul. They had long been preparing for war against Lorien, apparently. The best description of a Moria orc comes when one attacks Frodo in the chamber. A huge orc chieftain, almost man-high, clad in black mail from head to foot, leaped into the chamber, his broad flat face was swart, his eyes were like coals, and his tongue was red, he wielded a great spear. With a thrust of his huge shield he turned Boromir's sword and bore him backwards, throwing him to the ground. Orc copyright copyright Rich Sullivan. Used by permission. It required Sam's intervention to get the orc away from Frodo, and Aragorn had to strike the orc on the head from behind in order to kill him, the one apparent ignoble act on Aragorn's part. When next we meet the orcs we are standing with Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas by Boromir's body. Twenty orcs lay dead around the great warrior. Boromir's strength, courage, and prowess have by now been demonstrated, but these valiant attributes are for most readers overshadowed by his lust for the ring and his abruptness. The orc chieftain who could throw Boromir, captain of Gondor, to the ground must have been a considerable warrior in his own right, a champion of the orcs in war. Aragorn looks at Boromir's fallen enemies and says of them. Here lie many that are not folk of mortar. Some are from the north, from the misty mountains, if I know anything of orcs and their kinds. And here are others strange to me. Their gear is not after the manner of orcs at all. These were the Uruk High of Isengard, whom some readers feel are really half-orcs, an improved breed of orc warriors who were still mostly orc-like in appearance, unlike the half-orc spy who was aided by Bill Fernie in Bree he looked very human. Gandalf described Aragorn to Frodo in The Shadow of the Past, the second chapter of the Fellowship of the Ring as the greatest traveler and huntsman of this age of the world. It was a passing remark which Frodo forgot, 
he did not seem to recall it when he finally met Aragorn in Bree. But it was the kind of praise Gandalf seldom dished out. Of himself Aragorn tells Eomer, on their first meeting, there are few among mortal men who know more of orcs than Aragorn does. Aragorn's credentials in orc lore are thus acceptable. He knows something of their kindreds and ways and he is willing to state to a marshal of the mark that he knows more than anyone in Rohan about orcs. So when Aragorn looks at Saruman's orcs and does not recognize them, one must wonder what was so different about them that Aragorn should be intrigued. There were four goblin soldiers of greater stature, swart, slant-eyed with thick legs and large hands. They were armed with short broad blade swords, not with the curved scimitars usual with orcs, and they had bows of yew in length and shape like the bows of men. Upon their shields they bore a strange device, a small white hand in the center of a black field, on the front of their iron helms was set an S rune, wrought of some white metal. Pippin wakes up among the orcs and one speaks to him, stooping over the bound hobbit, bringing his yellow fangs close to Pippin's face. Are all orcs fanged? Was this just one of the northern orcs from the Misty Mountains? The orcs debate whether they should kill the hobbits. There is no time to kill them properly, said one. No time for play on this trip. Another wants to know if the hobbits give good sport. Pippin finally gets a good look, and the readers with him, when Ugluck, the orc leader from Isengard, and Grishnak, the orc leader from Mortar, start arguing over who should command the expedition. In the twilight he saw a large black orc, probably Ugluck, standing facing Grishnak, a short crook-legged creature, very broad and with long arms that hung almost to the ground. Round them were many smaller goblins. Pippin supposed that these were the ones from the north. Again we have a passage that some readers feel implies that not all orcs were black-skinned. Ugluck seems to be no larger than Grishnak but they have different body shapes. Ugluck is almost man-like in appearance, whereas Grishnak is almost ape-like. One of the orcs who carries Pippin has claw-like hands. In other passages the orcs grab him with long arms, hard claws, and rending nails. One of the orcs carrying Pippin has a filthy jowl and hairy ear. We get one last look at Grishnak when he steals away with Pippin and Merry at the edge of Fangorn Forest. A long hairy arm took each of them by the neck and drew them close together. Dimly they were aware of Grishnak's great head and hideous face between them. Suddenly he seized them. The strength in his long arms and shoulders was terrifying. The mortar orcs come in different breeds and sizes as well. Gorbag and Chagrat, the two orc captains who fight over Frodo's mithril shirt, are large, long-armed Uruks. Grishnak must therefore also be an Uruk. Chagrat bears his fangs to Sam before running away, so probably all orcs had fangs. When two hunting orcs come close to Frodo and Sam during their journey through mortar, we get another glimpse of what some orcs look like. One was clad in ragged brown and was armed with a bow of horn, it was of a small breed, black-skinned, with white and snuffling nostrils, evidently a tracker of some kind. The other was a big fighting orc, like those of Shagrat's company, bearing the token of the eye. He also had a bow at his back and carried a short broad blade spear. It's hard enough to visualize the orcs given that there were so many physical variations among them. Some were probably hairier than others. Some were taller than others. Some had longer arms. Some had larger noses. There were probably variations in skin color, although only black-skinned orcs are ever described. Yet the orcs for all their belligerence were not entirely without their redeeming qualities. Not that there could have been a noble orc, or a philosophy which recognized such a thing. Rather, the orcs remained social creatures. They were tribal and clannish and they felt or at least expressed loyalty toward one another in various ways. Thus the orcs of the Misty Mountains traveled all the way to Rohan to get revenge against the Company of the Ring, not our orders, said one of the earlier voices. We have come all the way from the mines to kill, and avenge our folk. I wish to kill, and then go back north. Krishnak flees when Ugluk puts down rebellion among the orcs of the Misty Mountains but he returns with forty or more Uruks of mortar. I left a fool, 
snarled Grishnak. But there were some stout fellows with him that are too good to lose. I knew you'd lead them into a mess. I've come to help them. His reason for returning may be a lie, but it doesn't seem to be so. Shagrat and Gorbag appear to be old friends when they are talking in the tunnel of Sirith Ungol. But anyway, if it does go well, there should be a lot more room. What do you say? If we get a chance, you and me'll slip off and set up somewhere on our own with a few trusty lads, somewhere where there's good loot nice and handy, and no big bosses. Ah, said Shagrat, like old times. Of course, it's only a few hours later that Shagrat kills Gorbag, trampling him to death, so sentiments among orcs don't run very deep. It's both sad and amusing to listen to two orcs talking about setting up somewhere on their own with a few trusty lads so they can be mere brigands again, like old times. The orcs of Isengard demonstrate another kind of sentiment and loyalty, a nationalistic pride. Ugluk and his soldiers are assault troops, elite warriors who are proud to be in Saruman's service and don't care who knows that. Presumably Malraher and his lads, the orcs who attacked Eomer's men from Fangorn Forest, were another such group of elite soldiers. Saruman trusted them to handle a special mission, and their fierce adherence to Ugluk in fulfilling that purpose shows they were well motivated. In 1958 J.R.R. Tolkien reviewed a preliminary script for a proposed film adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. Based on his acerbic response to the script, most fans are pleased that movie was never made. Tolkien wrote a letter to Forrest J. Ackerman in which he provided many corrections and complaints. The one point concerning orcs has become fixed in Tolkien Arcana. In letter 210, Tolkien wrote 19. Why does Z put beaks and feathers on orcs? Dot. Z stands for Morton Grady Zimmerman, the first person ever to have written a screenplay based on Tolkien's work. The orcs, Tolkien continues a little further on, are definitely stated to be corruptions of the human form seen in elves and men. They are, or were, squat, broad, flat-nosed, sallow-skinned, with wide mouths and slant eyes, in fact degraded and repulsive versions of the, to Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. Much has been made of this citation. Some people have gone so far as to call Tolkien a racist, alleging he was implying the orcs were to be equated with Asian peoples. He is careful to say, however, that the orcs were degraded and repulsive versions of those Mongol peoples who would be least attractive to European sensibilities. Some people have suggested Tolkien may have been referring to the Huns, who left an indelible mark in the Western European psyche. Whether the orcs are intended to be degraded and repulsive versions of Huns is a mystery we cannot resolve, but it is clear that Tolkien felt a mongoloid base was necessary for orcish appearance. Not because he equated Asians with evil, or thought them ugly. But because he needed a human model which, when distorted beyond realistic appearance, might appear monstrous and corrupted. In fact, Many Asian cultures represent demons and evil gods in a similar fashion. I feel Tolkien's choice was inspired by a broad understanding of mythology, and not by racism. We know too little of the other evil creatures in Tolkien's world to dwell long on any of them. The orcs are better documented than all the other evil things combined. Trolls are given a lot of credibility as powerful and deadly foes, Yet the episode in The Hobbit with Bert, William, and Tom is very disarming. They come across as a bunch of buffoons. One must wonder why the green-scaled cave troll in Moria was willing to stick its foot through the door in the chamber of Mazarbul so that Frodo could stab it. Was it in any way as silly as Bert or Tom? Probably not. There were a few other trolls in The Lord of the Rings. Two brought up huge slabs of stone to bridge the fiery chasm for the orcs in Moria. Pippin appears to have killed a hill troll in the Battle of the Moranon. Trolls were used to break down the gates of Minas Tirith. The Barrow Whites have intrigued many people. What were they? They were sent by the Witch King of Ongmar to inhabit the barrows of Tyr and Gorthad, the western branch of the South Downs. These spirits apparently worshipped Sauron, who was a master of phantoms even in the first age. Were they lesser mayor, corrupted by Melkor, 
or perhaps other spirits who joined him in EA. One also wonders if perhaps the Whites weren't elvish spirits, perhaps Avari or Sylvan elves, trapped by Sauron. Originally, Tolkien had envisioned many ring wraiths, including elvish wraiths, while he was writing the book. The Barrow Whites were at that time supposed to be related to the Nazgul in some way. But Tolkien narrowed his definition of ring wraiths, restricting the number of the great rings of power to just 20. The Whites could not themselves be ring wraiths, and perhaps they were not elvish spirits at all. The wargs of the Vales of Anjuin have elicited much comment among Tolkien readers as well. These were intelligent, evil wolves. They sided willingly with the orcs and could communicate with them. One might wonder if perhaps they were descendants of Dragluin and his brood of First Age were wolves. Dragluin and many werewolves were slain by Huon when Luthien and the Hound of Valina rescued Burin from Tol Sirion, where Sauron was stationed by Melkor after the Dajer Bragalach. Were all the werewolves slain there? Karcharoth was said to be one of Dragluin's descendants, and he lived in Ungband, not Tol Sirion. So it seems plausible that other werewolves or wolves survived the First Age, and that these may have been the ancestors of the wargs. Tolkien mentions five dragons in his stories, naming four of them, Glaurung, father of dragons, Ankalagan the Black, Skather the Worm, Smog, and a cold drake who killed Dane I and his son Fur of Durance line. Of course there were other dragons, but we only know that they lived and fought in the War of Wrath or troubled the dwarves on occasion. In fact, the dragons of the north multiplied, and they made war on the dwarves, and plundered their works. One might form the impression that there was some purpose moving the dragons, and it may be that during this time, third age 2035 to 2589, the dwarven rings of power were consumed by the dragons, or recovered by Sauron. The Balrogs were Melkor's greatest servants after Sauron. They were spirits of fire, corrupted by Melkor early in his struggles with the other Valor. Tolkien decided there were no more than seven, and presumably Gothmog, Lord of Balrogs, was one of the seven. We know that Gothmog and one other Balrog were slain when Gondolin fell, so there must have been only five left to fight in the War of Wrath. Of those five, one at least survived, for it fled to the Misty Mountains and hid there until it was awakened by the dwarves in the Third Age. Then it assumed control of Hazadum. What became of the other four Balrogs? Did they die in the War of Wrath? Did a Balrog possess the strength of will to reform itself after its body had been destroyed? How weakened would such reformed creatures have been? Would they have been subservient to Sauron? The Watcher in the Water, which lived in the lake that had been formed outside the west gate of Moria, was another strange creature. Was it one of Melkor's ancient monsters that eluded our OMS hunters, or was it perhaps some corrupted Maya in a hideous shape of its own devising? The Watcher could not have been in the lake for very long, nor even could the lake have been there for very long. Aragorn had passed through Moria some years before the Company of the Ring did and he had not encountered either the lake or the Watcher. One might also wonder whatever happened to Thuringwethel. She was Sauron's messenger in the First Age, and she most often took shape as a bat. Apparently she was one of Melkor's corrupted mayor. Did she perish in the War of Wrath? Did she survive to become some terror in a later age? And then there are the giant spiders. These things apparently lived in a lot of places, not just Mirkwood and Nandungorthabe. Shalab was said to be the last child of Ungoliant, but was she necessarily the southernmost giant spider? Where did the giant spiders of Mirkwood come from, since they were not there during the Second Age? Sauron must have discovered a breeding ground for them in some distant land, perhaps in the far north or in the east. Chapter 6, A Little Bit of Hobbit Lore It is difficult to find many obscurities concerning hobbits. They have been studied, catalogued, and discussed incessantly ever since the hobbit first appeared in print. Robert Foster's The Complete Guide to Middle-earth probably gives the most facts concerning hobbits of any reference work published to date. But here are a few tidbits I've gleaned from Tolkien's works. Where did hobbits come from? Tolkien gives us a concise history of the hobbits in the prologue to The Lord of the Rings, 
where he writes that their beginnings lie far back in the elder days. He tells us the hobbits themselves had all but forgotten their earliest legends by the end of the Third Age, and that they only recalled having left the Vales of Anjuin when a shadow fell on Greenwood the Great. The Elder Days were sometimes applied to the First Age of the Sun and the ages preceding it because those were the periods when the Elves, the Elder Children of Elevator, were the dominant creatures in Middle-earth. But Tolkien also wrote that Elder Days properly applied to the first three ages of the Sun. What then did he mean when he was speaking of the Hobbit's origins? I think he had in mind a sort of dual meaning. In speaking of their origins, he meant that hobbits had become a distinct group sometime in the First Age, but his references to their earliest legends were only to legends of the Third Age, because all previous legends had been forgotten. In a very lengthy letter to Milton Waldman which Humphrey Carpenter suggests was written late in 1951, Tolkien says this about hobbits. In the middle of this the Third Age hobbits appear. Their origin is unknown, even to themselves, for they escaped the notice of the great, or the civilized peoples with records, and kept none themselves, save oral traditions, until they had migrated from the borders of Mirkwood, fleeing from the shadow, and wandered westward, coming into contact with the last remnants of the kingdom of Arnur. The hobbits are, of course, really meant to be a branch of the specifically human race, not elves or dwarves, hence the two kinds can dwell together, as at Bree, and are called just the big folk and little folk. So hobbits are human. They are men. That means their ancestors awoke in Hildo Rhine, and they participated in the great fall of man, from which the Edain and a few other peoples fled early in the first age. It would seem that the hobbits themselves fled that darkness, but they may have taken a more northerly path and found themselves following part of the path of the great journey undertaken by the Eldar many ages previously. It's interesting to look for parallels between the hobbits and the elves. The hobbits, like the elves, were divided into three kindreds, the Fiohides, Harfoots, and Stoers. The Fiohides, the more adventurous hobbits, were friendly with the elves and could in some ways be equated with the Vanyar. Yet the most numerous hobbits were the Harfoots, who abhorred water, whereas the Lindar slash Tellery, the most numerous elves, loved water. The Stoers were the water-loving hobbits and they also got along better with the dwarves than others, whereas the Harfoots got along better with men. So there are really few parallels between hobbits and elves. But can we infer something about the hobbits' ancient roots from their historical associations? Perhaps. For instance, they probably at first entered Greenwood the Great from the southeast. The Fiohides could there have been the leaders of the migration, and would have encountered the Nandar and Avari who were becoming the Sylvan Elves. The forest itself was not then evil so the hobbits might have felt quite safe living there, and they probably had little to do with the Elves. When Orifer of Doriath established his kingdom in southern Greenwood it might have been time for the hobbits to move on, or perhaps they continued to dwell close by the Sylvan Elves until Orifer started moving his people north. Then the hobbits would have had to move as well. Perhaps by the middle of the Second Age the Stoers were living close to the Anjuin. The Harfoots might originally not have been intimidated by water, but they may have suffered some great disaster that left them shaken enough to pass on a fear of water to later generations. They would have had to cross Anjuin by the ancient dwarf bridge that existed in the Second Age north of the Gladden River. This guess implies the Harfoots may have been the most northern branch of the Hobbits, which seems to coincide with what Tolkien says about their entry points into Eridador in the Third Age. The time of the Hobbits' arrival in what came to be called Ravanian is a mystery. However, the peoples of Middle-earth tells us something about the history and cultures of the region known as Ravanian in the Third Age. Edenic peoples had lived there since the First Age, and they in many places developed a close relationship with the dwarves of Durin's folk. In time some of the Edain also came to develop a relationship with the hobbits, living in joint communities or close by one another much as the hobbits and men of Bree did in the Third Age. The most critical information to be gleaned from the peoples of Middle-earth is that hobbits were not present among the Edenic communities prior to the War of the Elves and Sauron. The Edenic civilization was destroyed, and it would be many centuries before these peoples recovered. Hence, 
the hobbits must have arrived some time after the war. Perhaps the war itself stirred them up and caused the migration. There are no ancient records from the Edain of the Second Age. Hence, the only mention of hobbits among any northern people is what Theoden alludes to when he meets Merry and Pippin. His people, being descended of the Eotheod, survivors of the ancient kingdom of Ravanian, remembered some of the lore their fathers had brought out of the north. Before settling in the distant north, the Eotheod lived for over a hundred years near the Gladden River at a time when clans of Stoer still dwelt there. This is probably the source of Theoden's lore about the whole builders. Because the host of the last alliance of elves and men marched south along the Anjuan, one should expect Tolkien to have at least dropped in a casual mention of an encounter between the hobbits and the last alliance if the hobbits were living there. But there is no such reference. So it may be that placing the hobbits in Greenwood the Great and the Vales of Anjuan during the Second Age is incorrect. If so, they would have had to enter Greenwood before Sauron settled on Amon Lank, but how long could they have lived in the forest? Also, the ancient dwarf bridge had become a ford by the time Gilgalad and Elendil led their armies through the Vales, so how would the Harfoots have crossed the river? Could they perhaps have suffered a disastrous crossing in the Third Age? Thranduil's people were living in the Imandur for the first 1000 years of the Third Age. The ancient dwarf road ran straight past their lands to some obscure point on the Sulduin. Perhaps the hobbits came up the Sulduin from the Sea of Ruin, passed through Greenwood by the old forest road, the Meninogram, and managed to find a way across the river at the old ford. The Fiohides might thus have been the last group on the march, and would have stayed in the forest. Either way, the Fiohides appear to be the group who started the migration which brought the hobbits over the Hithaler. Tolkien writes that men were increasing in number and that a shadow fell on the forest, so the Fiohides must have crossed the Anjuan and settled among the Harfoots, who became concerned about the evil taking shape in Greenwood and crossed the mountains. It may be that memories of the War of the Last Alliance existed among the hobbits, either drawn from ancient experience or from exchanging tales with men and elves in Ravanian. But what is certain is that the Stoers were the most southern branch of the hobbits, and they probably had developed a trading relationship with the dwarves of Hazadum before crossing the Rethorn Pass. The Harfoots and Fiohides may have been familiar to the woodmen and the elves of Thranduil's realm. What happened to Smeagol's people? We can only speculate, but in Unfinished Tales Tolkien writes that the Stoers of the Gladden Fields may have fled north late in the Third Age. There is no mention of other hobbits when Bilbo passes through the Vales of Anjuan, but at the time Tolkien wrote The Hobbit he had not envisioned the Stoers of the Gladden Fields, and in fact may not have quite known what Gollum was. Hobbits were not easy to kill. They would either fight back against their enemies or move away, so the Stoers may have just picked up and moved on. They were close to Lorien and Moria, and when Sauron began to settle orcs in the mountains, the Stoers might have decided to find another home somewhere farther north. This would have happened in the 26th century, a few generations after Smeagol left his people. We know that there were no longer Stoers living near the Gladden River by 2851, when Saruman started searching in the region for the One Ring. So, sometime between 2463, when Smeagol killed his cousin Diagol, and 2851 the Stoers of the Gladden Fields either moved away or died out. It is possible they perished or fled in the long winter of 2758-9. How did hobbits go to sea? Tolkien wrote that some of the more adventurous hobbits of the Shire would occasionally take off, sometimes never to return. Where did they go and how did they get there? The Tooks were infamous for succumbing to this wanderlust, and one Isengar Took, youngest son of Gerontius the Old Took, was said to have gone to sea in his younger days. Isengar lived from SR 1262 to 1360. In the steward's reckoning that would be the years 2862 to 2960. Could the hobbits have visited Myth London? Possibly. The Shire was actually overrun by the Kingdom of Ungmar during the last war in Eridador in Ta 1974. Many people of Arnor fled across the Lhun to take refuge in Linden. The hobbits are said to have fled into hiding. 
Perhaps some of them wandered into the elvish lands. It would have been possible for a hobbit to walk from the Shire to Harlund, the southern haven of Linden. It seems remotely possible that Isengard took ship with some of Sir Dan's mariners, either from Mithlundon or from Harlund, if Harlund was still being used. It may also be that ships from Gondor occasionally visited Linden even in the late centuries of the Third Age. Isengard could, in theory, have gone aboard a Dunedon ship and seen the world, though he may never have set foot in Gondor itself, which supposedly never saw a halfling before Peregrine took showed up on the back of Shadowfax. Another possibility is that Isengar made his way to Tharbad. The city, probably no more than just a town by his day, still existed and had once been a port for the Dúnedain of Arnor and Gondor. He could have taken a boat or ship from Tharbad and gone down to the coastlands, where fisher folk lived, more or less Drudain. Isengar's sea voyage might have been nothing more than a boat ride along the coast, a rather inglorious type of travel to us, but still a bit of an adventure to a hobbit. It is also possible that some of the northern Dúnedain lived along and kept boats on the Luhun River. They might have taken a hobbit to sea on occasion, but Tolkien never wrote about any seafaring Dúnedain of Arnor in the Third Age. Chapter 7, Things You Might Not Have Known About the Northmen The Anglo-Saxon Myth In Appendix F to the Lord of the Rings Tolkien writes, Having gone so far in my attempt to modernize and make familiar the language and names of hobbits, I found myself involved in a further process. The Manish languages that were related to the Western should, it seemed to me, be turned into forms related to English. The language of Rohan I have accordingly made to resemble ancient English, since it was related both, more distantly, to the common speech, and, very closely, to the former tongue of the northern hobbits, and was in comparison with the Western Archaic. A few personal names have also been modernized, as Shadowfax and Wormtongue 1. 1. This linguistic procedure does not imply that the Rohirrim closely resembled the ancient English otherwise, in culture or art, in weapons or modes of warfare, except in a general way due to their circumstances, a simpler and more primitive people living in contact with a higher and more venerable culture, and occupying lands that had once been part of its domain. Despite this admonition from the author himself, many people choose to believe that the Rohirrim were indeed modeled closely upon the Anglo-Saxons. I am unlikely to persuade the hardened heart that this view might be erroneous, but I present below some observations about the Anglo-Saxons and the Rohirrim. Why did Tolkien use Old English to represent the language of Rohan? Perhaps the most commonly cited argument for ignoring the author's warning against identifying the Rohirrim with the Anglo-Saxons is the fact that he used Old English to represent their language. Christopher Tolkien published some of his father's loose notes concerning the geography and background of Middle-earth in the treason of Isengard. Of languages, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, Language of Shire equals modern English language of Dale equals Norse, used by dwarves of that region, Language of Rohan equals Old English Modern English is lingua franca spoken by all people, except a few secluded folk, like Lorian, but little and ill by orcs. In Unfinished Tales Christopher Tolkien writes, It is an interesting fact, not referred to I believe in any of my father's writings, that the names of the early kings and princes of the Northmen and the Eothead are Gothic in form, not Old English, Anglo-Saxon, as in the case of Liad, Eorl, and the later Rohirrim. Vigigavia is Latinized in spelling, representing Gothic Wijagoja, Wood Dweller, a recorded Gothic name, and similarly Vijamavi Gothic Wijamai, Wood Maiden. Since, as is explained in Appendix F, 2, the language of the Rohirrim was made to resemble ancient English, the names of the ancestors of the Rohirrim are cast into the forms of the earliest recorded Germanic language. Old English actually consisted of various dialects of an older language that was spoken by many tribes in Northern Europe. Partly because of their isolation in the British Isles, and partly because of a unique mixture of influences, the dialects of the Anglo-Saxons diverged from the main tree, so to speak. This divergence was gradual from the 5th century up until the 11th century, when the Norman conquest introduced French into the upper echelons of English society. 
Concurrent with the divergence of Old English was the development of Old Norse, which began with a phonetic shift that occurred over a period of about two centuries, typically given as the 7th and 8th centuries, so that by the time the Vikings, Danes, started settling in England in the 9th century, their language was changed enough to be different from Old English, and other German dialects on the continent. Tolkien used this concurrency of Old English and Old Norse to imply a concurrency between Rohirric and Dalish, with both deriving from the more ancient language which he chose to represent with Gothic. Old Northman Gothic plus dash dash plus dash dash plus plus dash dash plus dash dash plus. Rohiric Dalish Old English Old Norse. This linguistic device works well for native English speakers because Old English still sounds enough like modern English in some respects that we can feel more comfortable with the language of Rohan than we do with the names of the dwarves, and the kings of Dale, Jirion, Bard, Bane, Brand. The Dalish sounds foreign, whereas the Rohiric sounds archaic, and this effect underscores the distance between the Rohirrim and the men of Dale. In fact, because the hobbits of the Shire still had a few words in common with Rohan, the language of Dale needed to be more distant from their perspective. Thus modern English and Old English were excellent choices for representing the various relationships between all the languages. Hence, Tolkien's use of Old English to represent the language of the Rohirrim does not in any way favor the refutation of his admonition not to identify the Rohirrim with any particular tribe or nation. But what about Beowulf? Didn't Tolkien use material from the classic Anglo-Saxon poem? Beowulf had an unmistakable influence on Tolkien's work, and other Anglo-Saxon literature also influenced him. He was, after all, a philologist specializing in the study of Anglo-Saxon, though he was also quite knowledgeable in other languages. But though Beowulf survived in an Anglo-Saxon manuscript, it is a common mistake for people to think that it somehow represents an Anglo-Saxon culture or worldview. The poem is thought to have been composed sometime in the 8th century, 700s, when the Angles and Saxons still had close ties with continental Germans. It was very common for the Skalds to travel from land to land, telling the same stories and poems to audiences in many regions of the north. The story of Beowulf unfolds in Scandinavia and it concerns the Danes and Geats, a people of southern Sweden. There are in fact some historical names intermixed with the fictional characters. Many people have commented on the resemblance of Theoden's Hall in Adoras to Hierot, the Great Hall of Hrothgar in Beowulf. But Hierot was merely a typical northern hall. Such structures were built by the Scandinavians and Germans, and not just the Anglo-Saxons. There is nothing peculiar to the Anglo-Saxons in either Hierot or Theoden's Hall. Another popular element people point to is the similarity of Eowyn's cup giving to the Anglo-Saxon cup ceremony. But the cup giving was a custom among all the German and Scandinavian tribes, and even among many Celtic peoples. Highly ornamental drinking cups, horns, and cauldrons have been found throughout Europe. In fact, the cup giving was so well known that one gruesome legend tells us that the king of the Lombards forced the daughter of the last king of the Jepids to marry him after the Lombards conquered the Jepids. He forced the princess to drink from a gilded cup made from her father's skull. Beowulf was undoubtedly a classic tale that was heard in many ancient halls throughout the northern world. It would have been recognized in many lands and so represents a northern European culture, rather than an Anglo-Saxon one. Therefore any elements that Tolkien borrowed from Beowulf and other Anglo-Saxon poems like Witseth and Dur were pretty generic in cultural terms. Okay, but were the Rohirrim unlike the Anglo-Saxons in any significant way? Absolutely. Tolkien went to great pains to detail the culture of Rohan. It would be impossible, had he intended to make them look like Anglo-Saxons, for us to find significant differences between the Rohirrim and the Anglo-Saxon people but there are significant differences. For one thing, the Saxons were a seafaring people. The Rohirrim never used ships of any sort. They undoubtedly had some knowledge of boats, but Tolkien's Northmen are not pirates in any phase of their history, whereas the Saxons first entered history as pirates, and they did not lose their seafaring abilities. The Rohirrim also differed from the Anglo-Saxons in that they were not several tribes drawn together. 
When we speak of the Anglo-Saxons we really are referring to many groups of Saxons and Angles, as well as the Jutes and some Frisians. The Saxons were a West German people, related to the Franks, but the Angles and probably the Jutes came from Jutland they were essentially Danes. In fact, the Dane law, the region of England that was colonized by the Danish Vikings in the 9th and 10th centuries, overlapped with almost all of the ancient lands of the Angles. There are no tribal divisions among the Rohirrim. Nor was Rohan ever divided into many kingdoms. And the government of Rohan seems to be centered on a stronger monarchy than the Anglo-Saxons were ever able to establish. In fact, the nearest parallel in Rohan to the great English earls would be the lords of Westfold, of whom Erkenbrand was the one living at the time of the War of the Ring. Yet he was not only intensely loyal to Theoden, he apparently was much more under the king's authority than many of the English earls were. Of course, the Rohirrim developed their entire culture around the use and breeding of horses. They raised other animals, Eomer makes reference to herds and flocks, so they seem also to have raised sheep and perhaps cattle. But the horse was the center of the Rohiric culture. There was no similar society among the Anglo-Saxons. The Rohirrim lived in the mountains, too. The Anglo-Saxons were not a particularly mountainous folk. All of the Rohiric towns and villages were situated in the great valleys, and their refuges were hard to reach. The Anglo-Saxons lived in the lowlands and between the forests. The armaments of the riders of Rohan were also pretty generic. The best description Tolkien provides of these professional warriors is given in the two towers, when Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas first see Eomer's Eord, company, approaching them. The riders of Rohan copyright copyright Ankemen. Used by permission. Now the cries of clear strong voices came ringing over the fields. Suddenly they swept up with a noise like thunder, and the foremost horsemen swerved, passing by the foot of the hill, and leading the host back southward along the western skirts of the downs. After him they rode, a long line of mail-clad men, swift, shining, fell and fair to look upon. Their horses were of great stature, strong and clean-limbed, their grey coats glistened, their long tails flowed in the wind, their manes were braided on their proud necks. The men that rode them matched them well, tall and long-limbed, their hair, flaxen pale, flowed under their light helms, and streamed in long braids behind them, their faces were stern and keen. In their hands were tall spears of ash, painted shields were slung at their backs, long swords were at their belts, their burnished shirts of mail hung down upon their knees. These are not Anglo-Saxon warriors. They resemble Goths in several ways, and also sound a bit like Vikings. But their armaments were not atypical for riders of Rohan. The Rohirrim held a formal muster and Theoden expected some 12,000 riders to assemble, or, rather, said he could have assembled that many if there had not already been battles in Rohan by the time Hirgon, the errand rider of Dean Thor, arrived with the red arrow of summons. As for the armaments of Anglo-Saxons, Malcolm Todd, a professor of archaeology at the University of Exeter, wrote this in his book, Everyday Life of the Barbarians. The sword played a relatively minor role in Germanic warfare before the late Roman period, and even after that time it hardly ranked as the weapon of the common man. Centuries were to elapse before fine Frankish blades were to be highly prized by Viking soldiers, the one-edged slashing weapons of the pre-Roman Iron Age were gradually replaced by two-edged swords, but the introduction of this more versatile weapon was not accompanied by any significant increase in the number of sword-bearing warriors. Further on he writes. It is remarkable that despite fairly frequent contact with Roman frontier armies, and despite endemic intertribal disputes and private feuds, no great advances were made in armor and arms, with the exception of sword blades, during the imperial centuries, even as late as the 6th century 500s, the war gear of the Germans could be unfavorably commented upon. And the Anglo-Saxons closest of all the Teutonic peoples to the Franks in weapons and tactics were the Anglo-Saxon settlers in southern England. It has already been noted that, like the Franks and the rest, their use of cavalry was negligible. The offensive weapon of the rank and file was the spear, of which several types are documented, 
that with a long leaf or lozenge-shaped head being the best known. These spearheads commonly measure between 10 inches about 250 mm and 18 inches about 450 mm in length. The sax was frequently carried by the 5th and 6th century warrior, in Anglo-Saxon England as well as in Frankish Gaul, and was closely, almost mystically, associated with the Saxon name and race, body armor is ill-attested, except for the leading warriors. Helmets are even more rarely mentioned in Anglo-Saxon law than in Frankish, and only three specimens have been recorded all from princely graves. Leather caps may have protected lesser heads, but probably not many. The shield might be oval or rectangular. Finally, concerning the use of bows, which Eomer's men used against the orcs and which many of the Rohirrim at the Hornburg used, Todd writes. The bow and arrow, exotic in Merovingian Gaul and Anglo-Saxon England, was more widely used by other Germans. The Alemanni used a simple D-shaped one-piece bow, and, very rarely, a bow composed of several different materials. Bone or horn was usually combined with wood in these composite bows. In the late Roman period the long bow put in an appearance in the north. From which part of Europe this weapon was introduced is unknown but it was not from either the Roman Empire or from the nomadic peoples. Probably this was something the Germans developed for themselves. The fact that about 40 longbows and several bundles of arrows were present in the Nidum deposit suggests that small units of bowmen may have been used in the later 4th century specifically against armored Roman troops. Some of the Nidum arrowheads are narrow and heavy, and thus well suited to piercing body armor. In Unfinished Tales Christopher Tolkien reveals too many details concerning the riders and the muster of Rohan to repeat here. It was not, however, a feudal army of either the French or the English design. The army of Rohan was unlike any army fielded by the Anglo-Saxons, who used local levies called FYRDS to reinforce the main, royal, forces. There were, to be sure, local levies in Rohan, but these were raised only in great need. The muster of Rohan, divided into three smaller groups, was expected to defend the country. What about the burial mounds outside Adoras? There was nothing particularly Germanic about the funeral mounds of the House of Eorl, let alone of an Anglo-Saxon nature. Although the Anglo-Saxons built similar mounds, so did the Scandinavians, many have been excavated at Uppsala in Sweden, and in Denmark, and so did other Germans, and so did the Celts. In fact, the wagon burial of Theoden appears to be based on archaeological finds of Celtic wagon burials from the first millennium BC. Many comparisons have been made between the ship burial of Sutton Hoo and Theoden's burial. There are several problems with such a comparison. For one, Sutton Hoo was first excavated late in the 1930s just before World War II broke out. Although Tolkien wrote the passage describing Theoden's burial several years later, there is no mention in his letters or in the history of Middle-earth of any connection between the two. The excavation was thorough but left many unanswered questions, and Tolkien does not seem to have been interested in those questions, long since answered by subsequent scholarship. The lack of a ship in Theoden's mound doesn't seem to bother many people since, after all, Many ship burials were only symbolically linked with ships by shaping the mounds into ship contours. But the Odin's mound isn't so shaped. Although I have called it a wagon burial, Tolkien does not state specifically that the Odin's wain was interred in the mound with him. The mound was raised about a house of stone, which itself is not typical of ship burials, but does resemble some wagon burials, most of which were placed in wooden houses. I should also note here that many people also overlook the significance of what Tolkien wrote in the note I cited above, a simpler and more primitive people living in contact with a higher and more venerable culture, and occupying lands that had once been part of its domain. At what point in their history did the Anglo-Saxons fit this general description? The 5th century AD, when there was still a Roman Empire and the lands they were occupying in Britain were formerly part of that empire. There is certainly a great deal more contact between the Rohirrim and Gondor than there was between the Anglo-Saxons and Rome, but they were able to observe what survived of Roman culture through their neighbors the Celts and Franks. 
Some people argue that the Rohirrim are like the Anglo-Saxons of the late period, and there are greater similarities between these two peoples. But culturally the late Anglo-Saxons were no longer on the periphery of a great civilization, and Tolkien only reluctantly agreed to such a comparison when asked if the Rohirrim resembled the warriors in the Bayou Tapestry, which depicts how William of Normandy conquered England. I have no doubt that in the area envisaged by my story, which is large, the dress of various peoples, men, and others, was much diversified in the Third Age, according to climate, and inherited custom. As was our world, even if we only consider Europe and the Mediterranean and the very Near East, or South, before the victory in our time of the least lovely style of dress, especially for males and neuters, which recorded history reveals a victory that is still going on, even among those who most hate the lands of its origin. The Rohirrim were not medieval, in our sense. The styles of the Bayou Tapestry, made in England, fit them well enough, if one remembers that the kind of tennis nets the soldiers seem to have on are only a clumsy conventional sign for chain mail of small rings. Mail was an ancient armorial tradition, having been developed in the southern Mediterranean region around the 3rd century BC. Germanic warriors who served in the Roman Empire, including the Goths, wore such armor and the styles of the Rohirrim need not wait for the 11th century AD to find precedence in history. So, in conclusion, there was very little similarity between the Rohirrim and the historical Anglo-Saxons with which Tolkien was so familiar. The Rohirrim were idealized Northmen, a romantic people intended to convey the best traditions from myth, legend, and history of a northern people who were no better and no worse than other men. Note, Tom Shippey, in The Road to Middle-earth, argued that Tolkien really did base the Rohirrim on the Anglo-Saxons. This led him, indeed, into yet further inconsistencies, or rather disingenuousnesses. Tolkien was obliged to pretend to be a translator. He developed the pose with predictable rigor, feigning not only a text to translate but behind it a whole manuscript tradition, from Bilbo's diary to the Red Book of Westmarch to the Thane's Book of Minas Tirith to the copy of the scribe Find Egil. As time went on he also felt obliged to stress the autonomy of Middle-earth the fact that he was only translating analogously, not writing down the names and places as they really had been, etc. Thus of the Ritter Mark and its relation to Old English he said eventually this linguistic procedure i.e. translating Rohiric into Old English does not imply that the Rohirrim closely resembled the ancient English otherwise, in culture or art, in weapons, or modes of warfare, except in a general way due to their circumstances. 3. 414. But this claim is totally untrue. With one admitted exception, the writers of Rohan resemble the Anglo-Saxons down to minute details. The fact is that the ancient languages came first. Tolkien did not draw them into a fiction he had already written because there they might be useful, though that is what he pretended. He wrote the fiction to present the languages, and he did that because he loved them and thought them intrinsically beautiful. Maps, names, and languages came before plot. Elaborating them was in a sense Tolkien's way of building up enough steam to get rolling, but they had also in a sense provided the motive to want to. They were inspiration and invention at once, or perhaps more accurately, by turns. Professor Shippey should know better. In fact, as I have shown above, there is no distinct reference to the Anglo-Saxons in Rohiric culture. That is, Virtually nothing which is uniquely an Anglo-Saxon custom or trait is to be found in the Rohirrim. Numerous elements in Tolkien's depiction of the Rohirrim are far more easily identifiable with other peoples, including the Goths and Scandinavians, both of whose literature Tolkien studied extensively and knew intimately, a fact Professor Shippey does not concede in his elaborate argument. Thus Rohan is only the Gondorian word for the writer's country they themselves call it the Mark. Now there is no English county called the Mark, but the Anglo-Saxon kingdom which included both Tolkien's hometown Birmingham and his alma mater Oxford was Mercia, a Latinism now adopted by historians mainly because the native term was never recorded. However the West Saxons called their neighbors the Mears, clearly a derivation, by I mutation, from Mirk, the Mercians' own pronunciation of that would certainly have been the Mark, 
and that was no doubt once the everyday term for central England. As for the white horse on the green field which is the emblem of the mark, you can see it cut into the chalk 15 miles from Tolkien's study, 2 miles from Wayland Smithy and just about on the borders of America and Wessex, as if to mark the kingdom's end. All the writers' names and language are Old English, as many have noted, asterisk but they were homely to Tolkien in an even deeper sense than that. Professor Shippey should not rely upon such a flimsy argument. Mark comes from a very common ancient Germanic word which survived on the continent. Mark means march, or borderland. The Merkians were a border folk, living between the other Angles and Saxons and the Welsh, the foreigners, the remaining Celts who had been driven to the western regions of Britain by the invading Germans. Tolkien's use of the word Mark for the Rohirrim's own designation of their country is a clear extension of the ancient Germanic custom for using this term of a border region. The titles of nobility such as Margrave, Markgrave, and Marquis all retain the Mark Dash element, referring to a March Count, a borderland count. A count was originally a military officer appointed by a king to defend a region of the country, and the title was derived from Roman tradition, as in the Count of the Saxon Shore, a military office charged with defending southern Britain against seaborne Saxon raids. As has already been remarked, though, the writers according to Tolkien did not resemble the ancient English, except in a general way due to their circumstances a simpler and more primitive people living in contact with a higher and more venerable culture, and occupying lands that had once been part of its domain. Tolkien was stretching the truth a long way in asserting that, to say the least. But there is one obvious difference between the people of Rohan and the ancient English, and that is horses. The Rohirrim call themselves the Eothiad, Old English Eo equals horse plus Piat equals people, this translates into common speech as the writers, Rohan itself is Sindarin for horse country. Prominent writers call themselves after horses, Eomund, Eomer, Eoin, and their most important title after king is Marshal, borrowed into English from French but going back to an unrecorded Germanic asterisk Marhoskakos, horse servant, and CP the name of the hobbits hungest. The Rohirrim are nothing if not cavalry. By contrast the Anglo-Saxons' reluctance to have anything militarily to do with horses is notorious. The Battle of Malden begins, significantly enough, with the horses being sent to the rear. Hastings was lost, along with Anglo-Saxon independence, largely because the English heavy infantry could not, quite, hold off the combination of archers and mounted knights. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle entry for 1055 remarks sourly that at Hereford before a spear was thrown the English fled, because they had been made to fight on horseback. How then can Anglo-Saxons and Rohirrim ever, culturally, be equated? First of all, the Rohirrim did not call themselves Eothiad. That was what their ancestors were called. In a linguistic analysis Professor Shippey's word is virtually untouchable, but the historical framework he provides for the Rohirrim is questionable. The Rohirrim called themselves the Eorlingas, the sons of Eorl, a common Saxon custom, which survived in both the continent and England. A part of the answer is that the Rohirrim are not to be equated with the Anglo-Saxons of history, but with those of poetry, or legend. The chapter The King of the Golden Hall is straightforwardly calced on Beowulf. When Legolas says of Mediseld, the light of it shines far over the land, he is translating line 311 of Beowulf, Lixt s Elioma ofer landa fella. Mediseld is indeed a Beowulfian word, line 3065, for hall. More importantly the poem and the chapter agree, down to minute detail, on the procedure for approaching kings. In Beowulf the hero is stopped first by a coast guard, then by a doorward, and only after two challenges is allowed to approach the Danish king, he and his men have to pile arms outside as well. Tolkien follows this dignified, step-by-step -step ceremonial progress exactly. Tolkien's step-by-step -step adherence to Beowulf's actions is also questionable. Professor Shippey skips over the fact that Beowulf and his men were first hailed by a lone sentinel watching the coastline of Denmark. Mediseld certainly owes something to Hierot, 
a Danish hall which is an idealized vision of all the halls of the northern world. Professor Shippey would have the reader believe only the Anglo-Saxons built such dwellings for their chiefs and kings, but in fact all the Germanic and Celtic peoples had such longhouse-style halls for their leaders. So there is nothing Anglo-Saxon about the fact of the hall. And the story of Beowulf, though recorded in Anglo-Saxon, is not about Anglo-Saxons it's about Germanic warriors in a Germanic world. The Anglo-Saxons did not think of themselves as distinct from other Germanic peoples, not in that way. This is a purely modern contrivance, and one which has conveniently lent itself to the absurd arguments favoring the erroneous Anglo-Saxon identification of the Rohirrim. And as for the ceremony of piling arms, it was the custom throughout all the ancient world for strangers to give up their arms when entering the presence of a king or chieftain. Beowulf is hardly presenting anything unique in this respect. This argument improperly implies the custom was unique to the Anglo-Saxons. Thus in the king of the Golden Hall Gandalf, Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli are checked first by the guards at the gates of Edoras, equals enclosure, and then by the doorward of Mediseld, Hama. He too insists on the ceremony of piling arms, though Tolkien's character object more than Beowulf does, largely because he is a volunteer and in any case fights by choice barehanded. There is a crisis over Gandalf's staff, indeed, and Hama broods, reflecting rightly that the staff in the hands of a wizard may be more than a prop for age, he settles his doubts with the maxim yet in doubt a man of worth will trust to his own wisdom. I believe you are friends and folk of honor, who have no evil purpose. You may go in. In saying so he echoes the maxim of the Coast Guard of Beowulf, lines 287-92, a sharp shield warrior must know how to tell good from bad in every case, from words as well as deeds. I hear from your words that this warband is friendly, I will guide you. On the other hand, one charged with the defense of a nation does not permit an armed warband to wander through the lands unworded. Again, a very common practice is unreasonably equated to an extremely different situation in the Lord of the Rings. Beowulf and his men outnumbered the coast guardsmen. He had no choice but to accompany them to Hierot. Gandalf and his companions were, on the other hand, not accosted as they entered the country of Rohan, but were admitted to the king's city and processed according to the needs of the king's defense. The scenarios are so blatantly different that this comparison is quite misleading. The point is not, though, that Tolkien is once more writing a calc narrative, but that he is taking advantage of a modern expansive style to spell out things that would have been obvious to Anglo-Saxons in particular, the truths that freedom is not a prerogative of democracies, and that in free societies orders give way to discretion. Hama takes a risk with Gandalf, so does the Coast Guard with Beowulf. So does Eomer with Aragorn, letting him go free and lending him horses. He is under arrest when Aragorn reappears, and Theoden notes Hama's dereliction of duty too. Still, the nice thing about the writers, one might say, is that though a stern people, loyal to their lord, they wear duty and loyalty lightly. Hama and Eomer make their own decisions, and even the suspicious gate ward wishes Gandalf luck. I was only obeying orders, we can see, would not be accepted as an excuse in the Ritter Mark nor would it in Beowulf. The wisdom of ancient epic is translated by Tolkien into a whole sequence of doubts, decisions, sayings, rituals. Perhaps the wisdom of ancient epic was indeed being translated by Tolkien, but he relied upon more than one epic source, and his roots lie farther back than Beowulf. One could go further and say that the writers spring from poetry not history in that the whole of their culture is based on song. Almost the first thing Gandalf and the others see, nearing Mediseld, are the mounds covered in Cymbelmine either side of the way. Cymbelmine is a little white flower, but also means ever mind, ever memory, forget me not. Like the barrows it stands for the preservation of the memory of ancient deeds and heroes in the expanse of years. The writers are fascinated by memorial verse and oblivion, by deaths and by epitaphs. They show it in their list of kingly pedigrees, from Theoden back to Eorl the Young, in the suicidal urges of Eomer and Eowyn to do deeds of song, 
in the song that Aragorn sings to set the tone of the culture he is visiting, where now the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the hauberk, and the bright hair flowing? Song is very important to the Rohiric culture, but it is not based on song. If there is any culture in Middle-earth which is based on song it would be the culture of the Lindar, the early Niliar, from whom came the Teleri. Rohan's culture is based upon an idealized vision of the Northmen, the mounted Northmen. It is the horse which is central to Rohan's culture, not music. Music was common to all the lands of Middle-earth. Hobbits, elves, dwarves, and men all celebrated their deeds, gains, and losses with song. The working of power, the acts of sub-creation which Tolkien attributed to the elves and dwarves, and even to the valor, were founded in their use of song. Song permeates Middle-earth and its environs and inhabitants, and is by no means a unique attribute of the Rohirrim. Professor Shippey justifies this absurd exclusion of the full culture that Tolkien was representing in the Rohirrim by arguing that Tolkien may have known that the confusing Anglo-Saxon words for color were once words for the color of horses' coats, like Hajifal equals gray coat, suggesting an early society as observant of horses as modern African tribes of cows. Maybe the infantry fixation of historical periods was the result of living on an island. Maybe the Anglo-Saxons before they migrated to England were different. What would have happened had they turned east, not west, to the German plains and the steppes beyond? In creating the Ritter Mark Tolkien thought of his own Mercia. He also certainly remembered the great lost romance of Gothia, of the close kin of the English turning to disaster and oblivion on the plains of Russia. No doubt he knew the dim tradition that the word Goths itself meant horsefolk. This is what adds reconstruction to calking and produces fantasy, a people, and a culture that never were, but that press closer and closer to the edge of might have been. Here is a great blunder which reveals how shallow a role Professor Shippey assigns to history in his analysis of the Rohirrim. The Anglo-Saxons had no choice but to move west. They were themselves on the western fringes of the Germanic world. To migrate east they would have had to push through far more powerful peoples. The Angles were merely one tribe among many living in Jutland. They were Danes among Danes, and retained much of their Danish tradition after settling in Britain. The Saxons were a confederation of tribes in western Germany, living between the Weser and the Elbe rivers. Beyond their German neighbors were Wends, Poles, and other peoples as wild and barbaric as they. The Goths and other East German tribes migrated southward along the Vistula River centuries before the Angles and Saxons began their expansions. The West Germans could not have duplicated that migration, because new peoples had settled in the lands which formerly permitted a large Vok wandering that led to the emergence of Alaric in the annals of Rome. And the Goths, Vandals, and other Eastern tribes were themselves pushed westward by the Huns in the 4th century. How, then? could the Angles and Saxons have moved eastward? For what reason? There was never any hope of their acquiring a steppe culture, and to suggest that they need only have turned east instead of west is quite naive. In the end, Shippey has to concede that the Rohirrim are not historically akin to the Anglo-Saxons, but rather are only a poetic memory of them. But instead of referring to Anglo-Saxon poetry which might more easily be identified with the Anglo-Saxons, such as the Wanderer, he relies upon forging connections between Beowulf, a mixture of Anglo-Saxon and Danish traditions which echo the larger traditions of the broad Germanic world, and suggests they were only a step away from being Goths, the people who most resemble the Rohirrim in culture. And yet even the Goths lack something of the profound unity and purpose of the Rohirrim. The Goths when they entered history were wanderers and refugees. It would be many centuries before they found something which they could call a homeland, and then only a few of them would enjoy that homeland, and then only for a few centuries. The Visigoths alone of the Gothic nation found anything like a true peace for their generations. They left behind them a swath of lost Gothic hopes and compromising colonies of Goths who had grown weary of the endless chase for the national dream. The Kingdom of Dale This is one of the most enigmatic parts of Middle-earth, and I think that's a shame. Dale, and Lake Town, 
hold forth the promise of many interesting stories that Tolkien never found the time, or, perhaps, the desire, to tell his reading audience. In The Hobbit Thorin Oakenshield says that Dale was founded in his grandfather's day, and yet in other writings Tolkien implies that Dale existed in the 19th century when the Wayne Riders destroyed the Kingdom of Ravanian. We could contrive explanations for the apparent discrepancy, but all of our suppositions and guesses fail to provide the satisfaction that the author's pen would give. Dale and Lake Town were the only towns Tolkien ever described in the region between the Sulduin and Karnan rivers but he surely envisioned other towns, unnamed but important to the region. In The Hobbit he speaks of roads leading into the east from Mirkwood but not of their destinations. The men of Lake Town traded with their kin who lived along Sulduin in the south. Some of these other men apparently settled in Dale when Bard re-established the city in Third Age 2944. But Tolkien speaks of the Northmen living between Carnan and Sulduin growing strong and driving out enemies during two periods, Thur's reign in Erebor and the years after Bard restored Dale. It is logical to look for a town close to the Iman Ingrin, Iron Hills, because there was an ancient dwarf colony there, and the Carnan ran south from the hills, marking the easternmost boundary of Dale's kingdom. But how close to the hills would this town have been? Another logical place for a town is in the wooded belt that lay east of Sulduin in the region near the mountains of Mirkwood. This was north of the place where the old forest road ended at the shore of the Sulduin. One should think there would be a town at the road's end, but in The Hobbit we are told that the road vanished as it ran east, so any ancient town there was probably long since destroyed or deserted in Tolkien's mind. Another logical place for a town would be the confluence of the two rivers. Of course, we don't know how far southward Dale's authority extended. If there were Northmen living in that region, they may have had their own kings. The map in The Lord of the Rings does not indicate so, but the map of Wilderland, Ravanian, in The Hobbit implies that a line of hills or highlands marches east from Erebor to the Iman Ingrin. One should think the dwarves of the Iman Ingrin followed some sort of ancient road to Erebor when they went to reinforce Erebor. Could there have been a town between Erebor and the Iman Ingrin? The men of the Long Lake are our only example of how the Northmen of the region lived. These were a river folk, skilled in the making and use of large boats for war and trade. They had originally lived on the western shore of the lake, but that town was destroyed and they moved out into the lake itself until smog destroyed that town. We catch a glimpse of a rich and powerful community in The Hobbit, for they raised horses and cattle and conducted trade with the elves of northern Mirkwood and the men living to the south. The lake town was built with timber, including the boles of huge trees that had to be drawn from Mirkwood, probably with the aid of the elves. Tolkien envisioned the rebuilt lake town coming under the crown of Dale, although he did not explain how that should be so. Yet all mention of this fact was dropped from the Lord of the Rings in favor of an ambiguous statement about Dale's kingdom extending far to the south and east. An interesting statement that has always intrigued me is that Bard recruited men from the west. Where in the west? Did men come all the way from the Vales of Anjuin to live in Dale? Were there woodmen living in Mirkwood in the northeastern eaves of the forest? We never hear of any communities of men in that region, nor do we see indications of them on the maps, but in unfinished tales there is mention of men migrating south along the eastern side of the forest early in the Third Age. Interestingly, the peoples of Middle-earth tells us that the Edain originally migrated northward along the eastern eaves of the forest. The men with whom the Longbeards were thus associated were for the most part akin in race and language with the tall and mostly fair-haired people of the House of Hader, the most renowned and numerous of the Edain, who were allied with the Eldar in the War of the Jewels. These men, it seems, had come westward until faced by the Great Greenwood, and then had divided, some reaching the Anjuin and passing thence northward up the Vales, some passing between the north eaves of the wood and the Aird Mithran. Since Thranduil's people didn't settle in northern Mirkwood until about the year 1050 in the Third Age, Tolkien may have decided there were still men living in the northern woods at the end of the Third Age. Thus we can postulate the following groups of men were living in the region around the middle of the 30th century. The men of Lake Town, mixed with survivors of Dale, the men of northern Mirkwood, the men of Karn and the men of eastern Mirkwood. 
Probably there were several tribes living along the Silduan, but Tolkien provided us with no clues about where they lived. The Great King Bladerthan Most commentators think Bladerthan, who died before the dwarves of Erebor could deliver specially made spears to him for his armies, was an elf because his name ends with Thin. And yet there is no apparent etymology for the name. The only elvish word containing Blad is the abandoned name Bladerion. We do know something about the history of the region of Erebor, however, and there is no mention of another elvish kingdom nearby. Thranduil was the only elven king to live near Erebor during the centuries prior to Smog's arrival when dwarves lived there. Nor are the elves a particularly warlike people, especially if another elven realm did exist for they would have been sylvan elves or avari, essentially wood elves. It is perhaps significant that Blad sounds like the Anglo-Saxon name Blad, a, renowned, and that Bladerthin was originally intended to be the name of the wizard Gandalf, who in The Hobbit is presented as an old man. The evidence seems to point toward Bladerthin's being a man, not an elf. If we make the assumption that he was a man, can we also place him in some historical period? Perhaps so. For the memories of Thorin and Balin are the source of the legend of Bladerthin, and they were discussing treasures which were historically associated with Thur's reign when Bladerthin was mentioned. Therefore it may be that Bladerthin himself lived in Thur's time, and that perhaps he was a king of Dale. Thur ruled in Erebor from 2590 to 2770, and we know that Jirion was slain by Smog in 2770. It may be that as many as five or six kings preceded Jirion, assuming Dale was established soon after Thur settled in Erebor. We know that Jirion gave his emerald necklace, with 500 jewels, to the dwarves for the arming of his eldest son. An eldest son implies Jirion had at least one other and perhaps two or more sons in addition to the eldest. At what age would a prince have been richly outfitted by his father? 14. 16. 18. Perhaps Jirion was in his mid to late thirties when the eldest son was armed. But how long before Smog's arrival would that have been? We can look at the problem from another direction. Jirion's wife and young child escaped to Lake Town when Smog destroyed Dale and Bard the bowman was that child's descendant. Bard became king of Dale in 2944 and he died in 2977. It may be that he lived about as long as a king of Rohan, in which case we can guess that Bard's genealogy is similar in design to that of King the Jill of Rohan, who died in 2980. By estimating generations backwards, we can guess that Jirion's father should have been alive in 2770 as an old man. So why would he not have been? The long winter presents itself as a possible answer. Although Tolkien had not yet conceived of it when he wrote The Hobbit, had he fleshed out the genealogy of the kings of Dale he might indeed have decided to end a reign in 2758-9, just as he ended the reign of Helm Hammerhand during that winter. Thus, if Jirion's father died in the long winter, he would have come to the throne of Dale at a young age. Furthermore, his people would have suffered terribly in the winter just as the peoples of Rohan and Eridador suffered in it. If Jirion's father had been preparing for war, the preparations would have been cut short by the deaths of the king and many of his warriors. And that brings us back to Bladerthin. Would Tolkien have decided that Bladerthin was Jirion's father? We'll never know. But so many pieces fall together to support the idea that it seems hard to imagine Tolkien would have reached any other conclusion. Chapter 8, What Does an Elf Do in Amman? When you stop to think about it, what is there to do in Amman? Before they went into exile the Noldor quarried the hills and mountains of Valinor for stone with which to build their homes and towers. They must have paved a lot of roads throughout Amman just to help them move the stone around. But what else did they do while they were building their civilization? They mined the mountains for ores and gems and hunted in the woods of Arom, probably alongside the Vanyar. It may also be that some of the Noldor went sailing with the Falmari on occasion, the Falmari dove for pearls, which they traded to the Noldor for gemstones and in payment for their help in building Alqualund. But basically there must have been very little to do except sit around singing all day long, or feasting with the Valor and Mayor. To Anoldo, 
who had to be doing something constructive, life in the blessed realm may have been quite boring. Why else would Melker's subtle suggestions that they could have had so much more in Middle-earth have struck a nerve with the Noldor? After the exiles returned to Tol Eresi in the Second Age they don't seem to have remained content with sitting around and singing all day long. Quite possibly the Eldar who sailed to Numenor to teach the Dúnedain included many Noldor who wanted to get back into the swing of things. Helping the Edain build a new nation might have been just the trick for them. The Sindar probably were the elves who took trees, plants, and animals to Numenor. They, too, may have gotten bored with the dull life of living in the Blessed Realm. What must the Valor have had to do to keep the elves happy through all those thousands of years? There could have been quite a few horse races, hunting competitions, and probably an excruciatingly long tradition of poetry and singing contests. How many variations on Lament for the Two Trees could the Vanyar have composed? Librarians may have been in great demand among the elves. Once Rumil invented the Tengwar and Fianor revised them, the elves must have composed a storm of songs, stories, histories, etc. They must also have spent ages just analyzing all the linguistic knowledge the Noldor and Sindar brought from Middle-earth. After Amon was taken away from the circles of the world, the elves must have felt pretty isolated. Sure, a ship or two would come sailing up to Tol Eresi every now and then, bearing fresh news of events in the mortal lands, new additions for the genealogies, that probably only changed slightly every few hundred years, and the occasional new idiom from some half-known dialect in the more distant regions of Middle-earth. And just where exactly did all the elves who sailed to Amon settle down? How large did Avalon become? Did anyone ever leave the city permanently? The Valor or Noldor of Tyrion must have given the tree named Sealborn to the elves of Beleriand as a symbol of restored communion. But were the elves of Tol Eresi allowed to move to the mainland? Since there was supposedly a palantir in Avalon that was attuned to the Elendile stone which was kept on the Tower Hills near Myth London, did the elves set up some sort of message system whereby the folks in Middle-earth could exchange greetings and news with the folks back in Amon? Gildar and Glorian apparently spent a lot of time visiting this palantir. Surely, with memories as good as they were among the elves, he didn't need to refresh his vision of the West every couple of years. And isn't it strange how we know what happened to A.R. Farazan after he attacked Valinur? How did that knowledge survive, unless Elendil, who wrote the Akalabith, got on the line with someone in Tol Eresi and found out what happened? One must wonder who the elven lords of Tol Eresi were. They visited Numenor for the wedding of Alderion and Arendus. Was Finrod Felagund one of them? Yet he is said to walk with Finarfin his father beneath the trees in Eldamar. Maybe he didn't have to settle in Tol Eresi. And did Finrod ever marry Amery, the Vanierin elf who was not allowed to accompany him into exile? If so, perhaps there were a lot of weddings in Amman after the return of the exiles. The Noldor did tend to intermarry with the other elves a great deal. One might do well to ask what the elves do all day, now that they've left a legacy of great wars and dooms behind them in Middle-earth. They're unlikely to rebel against the Valor again, nor to be threatened by any evil creatures. Maybe they spread out into all the uninhabited regions of Amon, building cities, planting forests, digging new mines and quarries, and generally just having a grand old time building a new civilization that surpassed the ancient one in too many ways to count. There must have been quite a few tribes in Amon by the time Numenor was destroyed, the Vanyar, the Noldor of Finarfin, the Falmari, the Noldor of Tol Eresi, the Sindar of Tol Eresi, and any Sylvan elves who were starting to show up. Where did Legolas and Gimli finally settle? For that matter, was Galadriel forced to stay in Avalon? What if she wanted to visit Finarfin in Eldamar, or Valinur, assuming Eldamar was too damaged for the Noldor of Tyrion to return there after A.R. Farazan's little party? Where would Sealborn end up staying once he finally showed up? Would he have to settle for visiting relatives for the next couple of thousand years? What about Elrond and Sealbrian? And Elodin and Elroer? assuming they chose to be of elven kind? Did they go north to visit Elwing and Irondil? Was Elwing still living in that tower in the far north? 
Does Irindil ever bring out the Silmaril on high feast days? If Amon was not made into a new world with new continents to explore, maybe the elves perfected space travel and interdimensional warping so they can occasionally check up on things back in the mortal lands. If so, we might finally have an explanation of what all those strange sightings of UFOs relate to. Chapter 9, What Does a Woodman Do All Day? Few mysteries of Middle-earth have intrigued me more than the woodman of Mirkwood. We see a couple of villages on the map of Wilderland in The Hobbit, and we hear that the woodman helped in the hunt for Gollum after he escaped from the elves of northern Mirkwood, but there really is very little else that Tolkien writes about them. Who were these guys? Why were they living in Mirkwood? What did they do all day? The woodmen, according to Tolkien, were related to the Beernings and other Northmen. There is mention of woodmen in The Hobbit. These men live on the west side of Anjuin, north of the Gladden River. They are gradually spreading north through the 30th century and some live close enough to the Hithaler, Misty Mountains, that they are threatened by the orcs and wargs, and the eagles occasionally hunt their sheep. These woodmen of the Hobbit were undoubtedly some or all of the men who later accepted Beorn as their chieftain. That is not to say that they were all Beornings, but they appear to be the link between Beorn and the woodmen of Mirkwood. Probably some of the Mirkwood woodmen crossed the river after the War of the Dwarves and Orcs, ta 2793-99, when the Hithaler would have been thought safe by many people. They could have, by 2941, spread pretty far north, assuming each generation sent out new colonists. In Mirkwood the woodmen may have lived much as the Haladen of Brethel had lived. I infer this because Rodagast the Brown lived at Rosegobel, a fenced garth just within the western border of Mirkwood at about the same region as the Gladden Fields, close to Dol Golder on Amon Lank, of all places. Rosegobel is translated as brown hay, and hay is used to mean a great hedge, like the hedge the hobbits of the Buckland raised as a barrier against the old forest and called the high hay. Although Rosegobel is not described in detail, Bjorn's house is, and it too was surrounded by a high hedge. When compared with the homes of the Haladen living to the south of Brethel in Narn I Chin Huron, Bjorn's home sounds very similar. So the woodmen of Mirkwood probably lived in stockade villages and isolated homesteads that were defended by these hedges from wild beasts. Orcs and giant spiders probably would not have been deterred by the hedges, so the woodmen undoubtedly had to patrol their land. This means they would have lived much like the Haladen lived in Brethel. Probably some of them got tired of living that way, and that is why they may have crossed the river, but this is all speculation, since Tolkien never explained where the woodmen of the Hobbit came from, other than to say they had come from the south. The woodmen of Mirkwood were friendly with the elves. We know this from passages in The Lord of the Rings and The Disaster of the Gladden Fields in Unfinished Tales. They may therefore have engaged in some trade with the elves early in their history but they were probably quite isolated from Thranduil's people late in the Third Age. The life of a woodman thus would have been a hard one. They would have had a strong sense of family and kin, but may have been distrustful of strangers, as Bjorn and the Haladen were. They probably hunted with bows, the eagles told Gandalf they feared the great U-bows of the woodman. And they may have raised hunting dogs, Bjorn had some dogs, as well as horses, cattle, and sheep, all of which Bjorn had. It's unlikely the woodmen had animals as enchanting as Bjorn's, able to serve food to guests. And probably the woodmen fished a little and raised a few crops. The woodmen must also have gotten together on occasion, to celebrate births and weddings, or perhaps just seasonal feasts. House raising may also have been common among them. It would have been important for a family to get its home built and fortified as quickly as possible. Such activities would have required iron tools, so the woodmen must also have welcomed traders from distant lands, or organized their own trading expeditions. They may also have formed regular hunting or raiding parties which would have gone in search of evil creatures. It would have been better for them to do this than to wait at home for raids from the orcs. In many ways, the woodmen of Mirkwood and the Vales of Anjuin must have lived a very dangerous and adventurous lifestyle, Frontiersmen in Wilderland. Chapter 10, Planning the Middle-Earth Wedding. 
Occasionally people inquire in the Tolkien news groups about wedding traditions in Middle Earth so they can add some enchantment to their own wedding plans by emulating the traditions in their favorite fictional world. That's a rather nice idea but it's difficult to find many details in Tolkien about weddings. He mentions weddings. Aragorn married Arwen in Gondor. That was a royal wedding which must have seemed very much like Prince Charles's wedding to Lady Diana Spencer. The wedding of Burren and Luthien was also probably quite a sensation, but Tolkien writes virtually nothing about it. In one early version of the story of Tuor and Idril they are married by Turgon in Gar Onion, the place of the gods, and the entire city celebrates. But Tolkien abandoned the idea that the Valor were in any way gods, and probably Gar Onion ceased to be a part of Gondolin. In the Silmarillion the wedding of Tuor and Idril is still celebrated by a feast, but no other detail is mentioned. A feast was also used to celebrate the joint wedding of the children of Hader and Halmer. So feasts seem to be a consistent part of the wedding tradition in Middle-earth, whereas we normally have a rehearsal dinner one or two days before the wedding and then just a reception after the ceremony, see below. The wedding of Alderion and Arendus was held in western Numenor, and the Eldar came and gave them many gifts at the feast. Thus, it seems that, among the Dúnedain at least, the feast and giving of gifts was like the rehearsal and reception combined. It was also customary for the father of the bride to lay her hand in the groom's hand. Thing all does this for Luthien and Burren and Elrond does this for Arwen and Aragorn, but this custom does not seem to be part of the ceremony itself. Rather, it's a public declaration of the father's consent to the union, a symbolic way of saying, I give my daughter to this man. It was something equivalent to the publishing of bands, or to the wedding invitations which are sent out today. Anyone who saw the laying of the hand appears to have been invited to the ceremony, but this is only an inference. Singing and dancing were important to the peoples of Middle-earth. It may be that songs or poems were recited at the weddings, at least of the princely houses, and that part of the feasting included dancing, much as dancing may be part of the reception today. It thus seems that Tolkien envisioned Middle-earth weddings to be very much like they are handled in Western culture today. The only special gesture seems to be the father's laying of the daughter's hand in the groom's hand prior to the ceremony, and there was apparently no rehearsal dinner or quaint reception, but simply a feast after the ceremony where the couple sat at the table and received presents and guests. Probably, Styling a wedding after Middle-earth's weddings would raise a few eyebrows and invite unwarranted commentary from the more outspoken relatives of both families. But if two people want to be wed as if they were in Middle-earth, it might be possible to come up with a reasonable compromise between today's traditions and Tolkien's. Well, since I wrote the above, I've reread Morgoth's ring and have found a treasure trove of information on Eldarin marriage customs there. What follows here are citations from the essay of the laws and customs among the Eldar pertaining to marriage and other matters related thereto, together with the statute of Finwy and Myriel and the debate of the valor at its making. The details on marriages are only a small part of the essay. The Eldar wedded for the most part in their youth and soon after their fiftieth year. They had few children, but these were very dear to them. Their families, or houses, were held together by love and a deep feeling for kinship in mind and body, and the children needed little governing or teaching. There were seldom more than four children in any house, and the number grew less as ages passed, but even in days of old, while the Eldar were still few and eager to increase their kind, Fianor was renowned as the father of seven sons, and the history's record none that surpassed him. The Eldar wedded once only in life, and for love or at the least by free will upon either part. Even when in after days, as the histories reveal, many of the Eldar in Middle-earth became corrupted, and their hearts darkened by the shadow that lies upon Arda, seldom is any tale told of deeds of lust among them. Marriage, save for rare ill chances or strange fates, was the natural course of life for all the Eldar. It took place in this way. Those who would afterwards become wedded might choose one another early in youth, even as children, and indeed this happened often in days of peace, but unless they desired soon to be married and were of fitting age, the betrothal awaited the judgment of the parents of either party. 
In due time the betrothal was announced at a meeting of the two houses concerned, and the betrothed gave silver rings one to another. According to the laws of the Eldar this betrothal was bound then to stand for one year at least, and it often stood for longer. During this time it could be revoked by a public return of the rings, the rings then being molten and not again used for a betrothal. Such was the law, but the right of revoking was seldom used, for the Eldar do not err lightly in such choice. They are not easily deceived by their own kind, and their spirits being masters of their bodies, they are seldom swayed by the desires of the body only, but are by nature continent and steadfast. After the betrothal it was the part of the betrothed to appoint the time of their wedding, when at least one year had passed. Then at a feast, again shared by the two houses, the marriage was celebrated. At the end of the feast the betrothed stood forth, and the mother of the bride and the father of the bridegroom joined the hands of the pair and blessed them. For this blessing there was a solemn form, but no mortal has heard it, though the Eldar say that Varda was named in witness by the mother and Manwi by the father, and moreover that the name of Eru was spoken, as was seldom done at any other time. The betrothed then received back one from the other their silver rings, and treasured them, but they gave in exchange slender rings of gold, which were worn upon the index of the right hand. Also, among the Noldur, it was a custom that the bride's mother should give to the bridegroom a jewel upon a chain or collar, and the bridegroom's father should give a like gift to the bride. These gifts were sometimes given before the feast. Thus the gift of Galadriel to Aragorn, since she was in place of Arwen's mother, was in part a bridal gift and earnest of the wedding that was later accomplished. But these ceremonies were not rites necessary to marriage, they were only a gracious mode by which the love of the parents was manifested, and the union was recognized which would join not only the betrothed but their two houses together. It was the act of bodily union that achieved marriage, and after which the indissoluble bond was complete. In happy days and times of peace it was held ungracious and contemptuous of kin to forego the ceremonies, but it was at all times lawful for any of the Eldar, both being unwed, to marry thus free of consent one to another without ceremony or witness, save blessings exchanged and the naming of the name, and the union so joined was alike indissoluble. In days of old, in times of trouble, in flight, and exile and wandering, such marriages were often made. It would seem there was therefore no such thing as premarital sex among Tolkien's elves. Once they joined their bodies, they were married. Rehearsals and Receptions I was recently asked by someone, who is not native to America or to the English language, what I meant by rehearsals and receptions. The reply I gave was, that is an American custom, but I don't know how widespread it is. A rehearsal is where the bride and groom with select family members, bridesmaids, groomsmen, et. al. show up at the church or chapel one to four days prior to the wedding ceremony. The minister, or whomever officiates, takes them through a practice wedding, although they probably don't recite all the prayers and stuff we didn't at my rehearsal. Sometimes there is a rehearsal dinner, usually paid for the by groom's family, immediately after the rehearsal. The reception is held after the wedding ceremony, sometimes in the same location, sometimes elsewhere. Usually, the bride and groom are having their pictures taken as the wedding guests join the reception. You might get a lot of food or just cake. Champagne is commonly served. Once the bride and groom show up, they speak to the guests, privately, if possible, and go through some traditions, the groom takes a garter from the bride's leg and throws it to the unmarried men in the crowd, the bride throws her bouquet to the unmarried women, they cut the wedding cake and give each other a piece. More extravagant receptions include dinner and dancing. Chapter 11 the wonders of Middle-earth wonders of the First Age Manigrath. Probably the greatest city ever to exist in Middle-earth was the ancient Sindarin stronghold of Manigrath. The Silmarillion tells us that Thingol and his people originally lived in the open woods of Neldoreth and region. It was not until the Third Age of Melkor's captivity in Valinor that Melian warned Thingol that Middle-earth would soon again be troubled by Melkor's evil. Thing all had by this time welcomed the dwarves of Nagrod and Belagost to his domain, and he was engaged in some trade with them. 
so he turned to the dwarves of Belagost and asked them to help him build a great fortress. The Silmarillion says. They gave it willingly, for they were unwearied in those days and eager for new works, therefore the Nagram laboured long and gladly for thing all, and devised for him mansions after the fashion of their own people, delved deep into the earth. Where the Esgalduin flowed down, and parted Neldoreth from region, there rose in the midst of the forest a rocky hill, and the river ran at its feet. There they made the gates of the Hall of Thing All, and they built a bridge of stone over the river, by which alone the gates could be entered. Beyond the gates wide passages ran down to high halls and chambers far below that were hewn into the living stone, so many and so great that that dwelling was named Manigruth, the Thousand Caves. There is no mention of any city like this over sea in Amman. Tuna upon Tyrian rose high, and Alqualund was set in a natural harbour. Even Avalon, built many centuries later, was nothing like Manigruth. The city was unique to Middle-earth's cultures and history, an inspiration for the later city of Nargothrond and the halls of Thranduil in northern Mirkwood, but neither of these habitations approached the majesty and beauty of Manigruth. The Silmarillion lacks the words to adequately describe the vision Tolkien must have held of the city. He writes only. Elves and dwarves together, each with their own skill, there wrought out the visions of Melian, images of the wonder and beauty of Valinor beyond the sea. The pillars of Manigrath were hewn in the likeness of the beaches of Arom, Stock, Bow, and Leaf, and they were lit with lanterns of gold. The nightingales sang there as in the gardens of Lorien, and there were fountains of silver, and basins of marble, and floors of many colored stones. Carven figures of beasts and birds there ran upon the walls, or climbed upon the pillars, or peered among the branches entwined with many flowers. And as the years passed Melian and her maidens filled the halls with woven hangings wherein could be read the deeds of the valor, and many things that had befallen in Arda since its beginning, and shadows of things that were yet to be. That was the fairest dwelling of any king that has ever been east of the sea. But Manigrath was never wholly finished. In time Thing all built armories for his warriors, and after Morgoth had destroyed the realms of the Noldor Thing all set aside chambers for the dwarves of Nagrod and Belagost when their strong companies visited the city. Manigrath itself was not completely underground. The lands near the hill were apparently heavily used by the elves. The great tree High Rylern stood in a garden on the north side of the river. Thing all had a house built for Luthien in the branches of the tree, but he and Melian also had sat beneath the overhanging boughs. Turin came to them in this garden when he decided to leave Manigrath. When Saros waylaid Turin, the man was on the northern road, seeking to return to the marches. No one heard their fight, but Turin chased Saros back toward the river, and then many elves did hear them, and came running to see what was amiss. Luthien prepares her escape from High Rylern copyright copyright Ankemen. Used by permission. The greatest hall of Manigrath must have been Thing All's court, of which we see only glimpses in the stories. Bilek brought the elf maiden Nellas into Manigrath to testify on Turin's behalf in the death of Saros, and she was afraid, both for the great pillared hall and the roof of stone, and for the company of many eyes that watched her. Burin, a generation before, had been brought into that same great hall by Luthien, and there confronted Thing All and Melian on their thrones. On both occasions the hall was filled with many of Doriath's mightiest lords and warriors. The king of the Sindar in all his power must have seemed stronger than any Nold Oren king in Middle-earth. But the time came at last when Manigrath was destroyed. The city was weakened in the feud between Thingol and the dwarves of Nagrod, who slew him in the chambers he had set aside for them. The dwarves fought their way out of the city but only two ever returned to Nagrod. And then a dwarf army marched on Doriath, and Manigrath was taken and sacked. Its treasuries were robbed and many of its people slain. Dior, Thing All's grandson, attempted to restore Manigrath to something of its former glory, but the Sindar under Dior were much weaker, and fewer, than the Sindar under Thing All and Melian. Melian had fled to Valinor in the wake of Thing All's death, and her power no longer protected or enriched the kingdom. Many of the great lords and captains had been slain, including Belag Cuthelian and Mablung. 
It was thus possible for the sons of Fëanor to gather an army of Noldor and take the city in midwinter, the last winter of Doriatha's long existence. The Sindar who survived the battle fled south, abandoning their lands and taking with them a few memories of the greatest of cities. There was never another city like Manigrath in Middle-earth, and probably not in Amman either. Gondolin After Manigrath the most famous city of Beleriand was Gondolin. Gondolin's fame, perhaps, arose only after its destruction, for while he lived Turgon did all that he could to protect the secret location of his beloved city. Only when Gondolin was destroyed could the Eldar begin to share its secrets, and the memories of Gondolin like those of Manigrath could do it little justice. Some hints about Gondolin were preserved in other stories, as when Thorondair carried Luthien and Burin south from Ungband, and Luthien saw far below, as a white light starting from a green jewel, the radiance of Gondolin the fair where Turgon dwelt. Hurin and Hewer saw the city but they did not reveal what they knew of it. Tolkien's vision of Gondolin changed through the years, but in some ways it persisted as a vibrant dream. He never abandoned the idea that it was built on a great hill in the circular valley of Tumlaton, that there were many high towers, great fountains, houses built all around, and fields of crops spreading across the valley to feed the city. The Eldar, Noldor and Sindar, of Gondolin followed eleven great lords in the earliest story of Gondolin, though in the Silmarillion we find only two named, Ecthelion and Glorfindel. In of Tuer and his coming to Gondolin we meet Elamakil, friend of Voronwy the Mariner. Egalmoth was said to be one of the lords of Gondolin, and his name was included in the story of Tuer almost until the end, edited out by Christopher Tolkien for a technical reason. The entrance to Gondolin lay through a dried river bed that flowed under the mountains at one time. There were seven gates constructed there by the Eldar, the Gate of Wood, the Gate of Stone, the Gate of Bronze, the Gate of Rhythm Iron, the Gate of Silver, the Gate of Gold, and the Gate of Steel. The first six gates were built when Gondolin itself was built, but Maeglin, Turgon's nephew, built the Gate of Steel after the Nirnaeth Arnoediad. Turgon's people were skilled in many ways, and they adorned the gates and the city with images of the two trees of Valinur, Telperion, and Lorelin, and of many flowers and creatures, including a graven image of Thorondair on the fourth gate. Gondolin must have been a shining, glittering jewel in many ways, adorned with gold, silver, pearl, marble, and even copper that was by some device of smithcraft, ever bright and gleamed as fire in the rays of the red lamps ranged like torches along the wall. Although not permitted to leave except by special permission of the king, Gondolin's people ranged through the hills and valleys around the city in their work. Maeglin especially opened many mines and ranged through the mountains, and so was caught in the end by Melker's servants. Although the plain of Tumladen is described as flat, Gondolin itself seems to have had mounds, of mallorns, birches, and evergreen trees. There was a high wall around the city, and the Eldar would gather on it at times to celebrate great festivals. It was during one such festival, the Gates of Summer, when Melker's forces stormed the city. Some of the towers of Gondolin were destroyed in the fighting, and many of the great houses and the trees were ruined by fire. The majority of the inhabitants were slaughtered as they tried to escape, or defending themselves. But many were captured and taken into captivity, while nearly a thousand escaped by Idril's secret path which led into the mountains. Gondolin must nonetheless have been the strongest of the realms of the Noldor. Melkor sent many dragons and the Balrogs against Turgon, and despite the ease with which he surprised them, more of Turgon's people escaped than did of Fingolfin's, Finrod's, or perhaps even Madro's people. Hazadum. We never get to see Hazadum in its heyday. By the time Tolkien brings the reader to the great mansions of the ancient dwarves, the halls are empty, except for orcs. Gimli's deep voice must have echoed through the empty tunnels and chambers as he sang for his companions an old dwarven folk song. The world was young, the mountains green, no stain yet on the moon was seen, no words were laid on stream or stone, when Durin woke and walked alone. He named the nameless hills and dells, he drank from yet untasted wells, he stooped and looked in mirror mirror, and saw a crown of stars appear, as gems upon a silver thread, 
above the shadow of his head. How long ago was this episode? How old was Durin before he found a wife, as he plainly must have, since he originally walked alone? How long was it before he found the mirror mirror and the entrance to the mighty caverns that he made his home? We can infer a few points about ancient dwarven history from what is told of their dealings with the elves. For instance, we know that the dwarves first entered Beleriand during the second age of Melkor's captivity in Valinor. According to the War of the Jewels, this was Year of the Trees 1250, which was 200 years after the awakening of the elves, a period equal in length to about 1900 years of the sun. The dwarven cities of Nagrod and Belagost, the two cities in the Aird Luin, were not founded by dwarves of Durant's line, but instead were the homes of other dwarves. They were most likely the ancestral homes of the Firebeards and the Broadbeams, the two kindreds of the dwarves who awoke in the northern Aird Luin. Hazadum engaged in trade with Nagrod and Belagost. Tales of Hazadum reached Beleriand, though it is only briefly mentioned in the Silmarillion as being the greatest of dwarven cities. The ancient dwarf road that passed through the forest of Greenwood, later Mirkwood, and through Eridador apparently carried traffic from Hazadum to other dwarven cities in the east. And yet Hazadum was far to the south of the high pass where the ancient road crossed the mountains. This seems a little strange. One can only imagine the dwarves had built a road north along the foothills of the Misty Mountains to reach the high pass. Or perhaps they followed the silver load down to Anjuan and crossed the river by raft or boat. And wondering this, one cannot fail to ask whether Durin's folk were friendly with the Nandoran elves who lived in the vales of Anjuan. We know something of the life the dwarves led in the first age. They were, of course, miners and stonemasons of exquisite and almost unrivaled skill. They smelted metals such as gold, silver, iron, and probably copper and tin. They worked with crystal, unearthed gems of many types, and even learned to make instruments such as trumpets and harps. The city itself conducted trade mostly with the east. There was no west gate until around the year 750 of the Second Age. Dwarven merchants must also have trekked into the distant north. The road passing through the forest ran to the Sulduin and probably crossed the river by a bridge just as it crossed Anjuan by a bridge. From the crossing point on Sulduin the road turned northeast and ran toward the Imaningrin, and from there ran eastwards to the other dwarven realms of the Iron Fists, Stiff Beards, Blacklocks, and Stonefoots. The peoples of Middle-earth tells us that dwarves did indeed live well to the east of Sulduin, and that there was a city or gathering place for all the dwarves at Mount Gundabad, where they held enclaves. The lands of Durin's folk were selected for this honor because he was the eldest of the dwarves and Gundabad was the place where he awoke. How numerous could Durin's folk have been in the first age? We can only guess. But the time from the awakening of the elves in Quibinan to the end of the first age of the sun was equivalent to approximately 4,900 years of the sun. Yet there was no mention of the elves encountering the dwarves during the great journey. On the other hand, the Noegithnaban, the petty dwarves, claimed to have settled in Beleriand before the elves arrived. The dwarves must have awoken soon after the elves did, but their numbers were few and increased only slowly. When they made contact with Durin some members of each tribe joined him in Hazadum. As the years passed a few outcasts wandered west into Beleriand. The Vanyar and Noldor entered Beleriand in Year of the Trees 1115, about 622 years of the sun after the awakening of the elves. The Tellery arrived in Year of the Trees 1128, or about 124 years of the sun after the Vanyar and Noldor. The Noegithnaban could have entered Beleriand before the Vanyar and Noldor. But they could also have entered after them and before the Sindar. Nonetheless, it is clear there had to be dwarves in Beleriand by year of the trees 1128, about 747 years of the sun after the awakening of the elves. If the dwarves awoke within 10 years of the trees after the elves, they would have had the equivalent of a few centuries in years of the sun in which to find each other and to cast out the Noegithnaban. Since Nagrod and Belagost were not founded until year of the trees 1250, 
almost 2,000 years of the sun after the awakening of the elves, it seems evident the firebeards and broadbeams must all have wandered east soon after they awoke. Perhaps all the dwarves came together in Hazadum with Durin first, and there built the first dwarven city. When their numbers became large enough, the six younger kings, descendants of the original fathers, could have led their peoples away from Hazadum to establish new ancestral homes for their peoples. This could explain why the Eldar encountered no dwarves on their journey. The only dwarves who would have left Hazadum by this time would have been the Noegith Nabin. So, what does this get us? Room to estimate a maximum probable population for Hazadum at the end of the first age of the sun, some 3,900 years of the sun after Durin might have awoken. This would allow 45 to 48 generations for the dwarves of Durin's line to increase their numbers. By the time the second age started, there could have been upwards of 100,000 dwarves living in Hazadum and more than 120,000 in most of each of the other dwarven cities, not including Nagrod and Belagost, which had by then suffered grievous losses in the wars with Morgoth and the elves. Early in the Second Age Durin's folk were joined by most if not all of the dwarves of Belagost, and many of the dwarves of Nagrod. The population of Hazadum could have swelled to 500,000 or more by the end of the Second Age, but this estimate presupposes some changes in dwarven birth rates signaling the onset of the decline of the dwarven race. Population estimates aside, we know that Hazadum grew slowly through the long centuries. The dwarves added hall after hall and gradually extended their mines northward, especially after the discovery of Mithril sometime in the 7th or 8th centuries of the Second Age. The West Gate was built during this time, after the Noldor of Eregen established their great friendship with the dwarves of Hazadum, who undoubtedly were influenced by tales of the friendship between the Noldor and the dwarves of Nagrod and Belagost. Tolkien wrote that Durin was reborn in his descendants six times. We know that Durin III was king of Hazadum when the Rings of Power were made, and he led an army against Sauron in the War of the Elves and Sauron. So it must have been Durin II who was king when Narvi and Celebrimbor built the West Gate. The king at the end of the Second Age may have been Durin IV. He marched with the host of the last alliance of elves and men. Hazadum continued to flourish in the Third Age even though the Eldar were in decline. The West Gate may have been reopened to allow trade with Arnor and, later, the peoples of Dunland. When the realm of Angmar arose in the distant north and Amroth of Lorien sent armies over the mountains to help the Dúnedain, it may be the dwarves gave aid to the elves, or even permitted Amroth's warriors to pass through Hazadum. But in time the dwarves awoke a balrog with their tunneling. It must have tried to drive them away at first, for they spent a year fighting it. Two dwarven kings of Durin's line perished before the city was abandoned in Third Age 1981. How many battles did the dwarves fight with the Balrog and, perhaps, other creatures they found in the subterranean depths? Durin VI was slain in 1980 and his son Nain I was killed the next year, the year of flight. The dwarves were destroyed or driven off and their ancient mansions were left deserted but for the Balrog and other creatures which Gandalf described as nameless things which even Sauron didn't know, for they are older than he. The Balrog assumed control of Hazadum, but some 500 or 600 years later Sauron sent orcs and trolls to inhabit the city, possibly with the Balrog's consent. From that time forward Hazadum was a stronghold and haven for the orcs and it was known only by its ancient elvish name, Moria, Black Pit. The orcish army of Moria was destroyed at the Battle of Nanjahirion in 2799, but the dwarves lacked the numbers after their seven-year war with the orcs to retake the city, and probably could not have done so had their entire army attacked Moria in the first place. The breeding orcs were left behind and Moria's evil creatures recovered their numbers slowly, but they may not have ever again equaled the great numbers that the dwarves encountered in 2799. Many of the orcs of the Misty Mountains perished 142 years later at the Battle of Five Armies, and when Balin's colony was established in 2989, a mere 47 years later, there were few orcs left to guard the citadel. They must have retreated to deeper caverns until the Balrog drove them to attack the dwarves, perhaps with reinforcements from other orcish strongholds. 
from 2994 to 3018 Hasadum was undisturbed until Gollum entered the fortress to escape Sauron's spies and the elves of Mirkwood and Lorien. The orcs either let him be or did not know he was there. But they were soon after roused by the company of the ring. The Balrog must have sensed the One Ring when it came into the Eastern Halls, if not sooner. The orcs pursued the company into Lorien but were destroyed or driven off, and Gandalf was able to defeat the Balrog in a single combat that lasted eleven days. In the course of the battle part of the mountain and Hazadum were destroyed. Sometime in the Fourth Age, probably by the year 200, the dwarves of Durin's line returned to Hazadum, most likely to spend the last of their generations there. Durin Seven was the last king to bear that name and perhaps the last of his proud and ancient line. Or perhaps not. In the Peoples of Middle-earth Christopher Tolkien points out that the life of Durin Seven is poorly documented, but that he apparently had descendants. Wonders of the Second Age The Statues of Dunharrow One of the most amazing passages in The Lord of the Rings occurs in the chapter titled The Muster of Rohan. Tolkien introduces one of his numerous enigmas by allowing the reader to follow Mary's progress through Rohan toward the refuge of Dunharrow, O.E. Dunharug, Hill Sanctuary. This scene contains one of the few glimpses we are provided of the Rohirrim in their homelands other than as riders at war. But Tolkien uses the images to draw the reader's attention away from the Rohirrim toward this great mountain where Theoden has commanded Eowyn to assemble the muster of Rohan. The road now led eastward straight across the valley, which was at that point little more than half a mile in width. Flats and meads of rough grass, grey now in the falling night, lay all about, but in front on the far side of the dale Mary saw a frowning wall, a last outlier of the great roots of the Starkhorn, cloven by the river in ages past. Mary's attention is briefly diverted to the army of riders, but since he cannot see much in the gloom he is brought back to the road before him. While he was peering from side to side the king's party came up under the looming cliff on the eastern side of the valley, and there suddenly the path began to climb, and Mary looked up in amazement. He was on a road the like of which he had never seen before, a great work of men's hands in years beyond the reach of song. Upwards it wound, coiling like a snake, boring its way across the sheer slope of rock. Steep as a stair, it looped backwards and forwards as it climbed. Up it horses could walk, and wains could be slowly hauled, but no enemy could come that way, except out of the air, if it was defended from above. At each turn of the road there were great standing stones that had been carved in the likeness of men, huge and clumsy limbed, squatting cross-legged with their stumpy arms folded on fat bellies. Some in the wearing of the years had lost all features save the dark holes of their eyes that still stared sadly at the passers-by. The riders hardly glanced at them. The Pukal men they called them, and heeded them little, no power or terror was left in them, but Mary gazed at them with wonder and a feeling almost of pity, as they loomed up mournfully in the dusk. After a while he looked back and found that he had already climbed some hundreds of feet above the valley, but still far below he could dimly see a winding line of riders crossing the ford and filing along the road towards the camp prepared for them. Only the king and his guard were going up into the hold. At last the king's company came to a sharp brink, and the climbing road passed into a cutting between walls of rock, and so went up a short slope and out onto a wide upland. The Firienfield men called it, a green mountain field of grass and heath, high above the deep delved courses of the Snowburn, laid upon the lap of the great mountains behind, the Starkhorn southwards, and northwards the sawtoothed mass of Irensaga, between when there faced the riders, the grim black wall of the Dwimorberg, the haunted mountain rising out of steep slopes of somber pines. Dividing the upland into two there marched a double line of unshaped standing stones that dwindled into the dusk and vanished in the trees. Those who dared to follow that road came soon to the black dim hold under Dwimorberg, and the menace of the pillar of stone, and the yawning shadow of the forbidden door. Such was the dark Dunharrow, the work of long-forgotten men. Their name was lost and no song or legend remembered it. For what purpose they had made this place, as a town or secret temple or a tomb of kings, none could say. Here they labored in the dark years, before ever a ship came to the western shores, or Gondor of the Dundane was built, 
and now they had vanished, and only the old Pukal men were left, still sitting at the turnings of the road. Mary stared at the lines of marching stones, they were worn and black, some were leaning, some were fallen, some cracked or broken, they looked like rows of old and hungry teeth. He wondered what they could be, and he hoped that the king was not going to follow them into the darkness beyond. Then he saw that there were clusters of tents and booths on either side of the stony way, but these were not set near the trees, and seemed rather to huddle away from them towards the brink of the cliff. The greater number were on the right, where the Firian field was wider, and on the left there was a smaller camp, in the midst of which stood a tall pavilion. We can follow the path Mary did not take by looking at Aragorn's passage through Dunharrow in the passing of the Grey Company. The list was still grey as they rode, for the sun had not yet climbed over the black ridges of the haunted mountain before them. A dread fell on them, even as they passed between the lines of ancient stones and so came to the dim hold. There under the gloom of black trees that not even Legolas could long endure they found a hollow place opening at the mountain's root, and right in their path stood a single mighty stone like a finger of doom. My blood runs chill, said Gimli, but the others were silent, and his voice fell dead on the dank fir needles at his feet. The horses would not pass the threatening stone, until the riders dismounted and led them about. And so they came at last deep into the glen, and there stood a sheer wall of rock, and in the wall the dark door gaped before them like the mouth of night. Signs and figures were carved above its wide arch too dim to read, and fear flowed from it like a grey vapour. Dunharrow has been supposed by some to be a construction of the Drudane, who are described in unfinished tales, and by others to be a construction of the men who drove the Drudane from the White Mountains, the men who later inhabited Endwaith and Minhiriath. These were the Gwathawurim, ancestors of the Dunlendings, the men of Bree, and many of Gondor's folk as well. But the truth more probably lies in the area of a succession of inhabitants and builders. The Pukal men were undoubtedly carved by early Drudane, perhaps even in the first age of the sun, although that seems unlikely. Since the statues are positioned on a carefully constructed road, it must be that they were intended to guard the way to a stronghold of the Drudane. Such protection would have been required only if there were enemies or potential enemies living to the north of Erd Nimreus. And yet Tolkien writes that Dunharrow was built before ever a ship came to the western shores, a reference, probably, to the return of the Dúnedain to Middle-earth, although it could also refer to the great fleet of Valinor. We know that the Dúnedain first returned to Middle-earth in the year 600 of the Second Age, and that by Alderian's day there were Gwathawurim akin to the Dunlending race living along the shores of the Gwatlo, this would be the 9th century, less than 300 years after Vientur's arrival in Linden. It is therefore possible that a single enclave of Drudane continued to survive in the Erd Nimreus after the Dunlending tribes drove other Drudane out of the mountains. But the Drudane of Dunharrow could not have held out forever even in that great refuge. They must have perished, slain or starved to death, or fled at last to join their kin either in the west, Druwaith Ior on the point of Andrast, the north, the marshes along the shores of Endwaith, or the east, Druidon Forest in Anarion. There is evidence that Gwathawurim dwelt in Dunharrow, and probably they were members of the tribe that later became known as the Dead. The standing stones Mary and Aragorn see, which are not carved, seem to represent a less developed stone craft. Yet we know from the stories about the early Drudane that they were always skilled with stone, so they probably did not make these men here like monuments. Instead, those were probably placed by the Gwathawurim. The writing above the dark door also implies that someone other than the Drudane had a hand in the making of Dunharrow. It may be that the Gwathawurim tribe had the ability to write, and they carved something above the door. Or it may be that a Numenorean hand had something to do with the carvings that Aragorn and his companions could no longer read. The latter seems less likely than that the Gwathawurim made the carvings, but the Odin seems to describe a man of Numenorean descent when he tells Mary the legend of the Dark Door. It is said that when the Eorlingas came out of the north in time of need, Brego and his son Balder climbed the stair of the hold and so came before the door. On the threshold sat an old man, aged and withered as stone. Indeed for stone they took him, for he moved not, 
and he said no word, until they sought to pass him by and enter. And then a voice came out of him, as it were out of the ground, and to their amaze it spoke in the western tongue, the way is shut. So we are left with many questions and enigmas. The ancient legacy of Dunharrow was already buried in forgotten wars and peoples by the time the Rohirrim settled in the region. One can only wonder what powerful tragedies unfolded there, and what days of glory or delight the Drudane, Hwathawurim, and perhaps others had experienced there in past ages. Wonders of the Third Age The Argonath One of the most impressive and majestic passages in The Lord of the Rings occurs when the company of the ring passes down Anjuin. They have been on the river several days and come at last to stony vales amid high moors, as Sealborn described the region. The approach passes by gradually climbing cliffs which creep down to the river's edge, almost as if to dip their feet in the water so as to share in its glorious adventure and urge it onward to its destiny. Tolkien writes. The rain, however, did not last long. Slowly the sky above grew lighter, and then suddenly the clouds broke, and their draggled fringes trailed away northward up the river. The fogs and mists were gone. Before the travelers lay a wide ravine, with great rocky sides to which clung, upon shelves and in narrow crevices, a few thrawn trees. The channel grew narrower and the river swifter. Now they were speeding along with little hope of stopping or turning, whatever they might meet ahead. Over them was a lane of pale blue sky, around them the dark overshadowed river, and before them black, shutting out the sun, the hills of Iman Mule, in which no opening could be seen. Frodo peering forward saw in the distance two great rocks approaching, like great pinnacles or pillars of stone they seemed. Tall and sheer and ominous they stood upon either side of the stream. A narrow gap appeared between them, and the river swept the boats towards it. So much passes by in these two paragraphs. The landscape has changed and become forbidding, almost threatening. The travelers are set upon a path of virtually no return. They have entered a region where a great power once set its hand upon the world, and the power of Gondor at one time had extended this far north. We are led with the travelers down this awesome path toward a goal which would intimidate any unwary observer, but which invites home Aragorn, the heir of Isildur. Behold the Argonath, the pillars of the kings, cried Aragorn. We shall pass them soon. Keep the boats in line, and as far apart as you can. Hold the middle of the stream. In a subtle way Tolkien seems to be revealing something to us of Aragorn's true majesty and authority. He is a ranger and a warrior, but also is the son of kings coming to claim his own, to defend his kindred in the south against Sauron's armies. At the very boundary of Gondor's ancient realm Aragorn assumes an authority Boromir the son of the ruling steward never tries to express. This is the actual moment of Aragorn's entry into Gondor as something more than an adventurer or traveler. He leaves no doubt as to whom he thinks he is, whereas Frodo and the hobbits are overawed and stunned by their first perception of the power and majesty of the Dúnedain in Middle-earth. As Frodo was borne towards them the great pillars rose like towers to meet him. Giants they seemed to him, vast grey figures silent but threatening. Then he saw that they were indeed shaped and fashioned, the craft and power of old had wrought upon them, and still they preserved through the suns and rains of forgotten years the mighty likenesses in which they had been hewn. Upon great pedestals founded in the deep waters stood two great kings of stone, still with blurred eyes and crannied brows they frowned upon the north. The left hand of each was raised palm outwards in a gesture of warning, in each right hand there was an axe, upon each head there was a crumbling helm and crown. Great power and majesty they still wore, the silent wardens of a long vanished kingdom. Awe and fear fell upon Frodo, and he cowered down, shutting his eyes and not daring to look up as the boat drew near. Even Boromir bowed his head as the boats whirled by, frail and fleeing as little leaves, under the enduring shadow of the sentinels of Numnoer. So they passed into the dark chasm of the gates. Sheer rose the dreadful cliffs to unguist heights on either side. Far off was the dim sky. The black waters roared and echoed, and a wind screamed over them. Frodo crouching over his knees heard Sam in front muttering and groaning, What a place! What a horrible place! 
just let me get out of this boat, and I'll never wet my toes in a puddle again, let alone a river. Perhaps Sam is expressing the feelings of all the hobbits at this point, and giving the reader a moment to pause and consider what his own reaction should be. The splendor and terror of the Argonath is poorly conveyed by the written word, although Tolkien has something more to say of these great works of the ancient Gondorians in one of his letters, written in October, 1958, to Rona Beer. The Numenorians of Gondor were proud, peculiar, and archaic, and I think are best pictured in, say, Egyptian terms. In many ways they resembled Egyptians the love of, and power to construct, the gigantic and massive. And in their great interest in ancestry and tombs, I think the crown of Gondor, the S kingdom, was very tall, like that of Egypt, but with wings attached, not set straight back but at an angle. The Egyptians did in fact create such huge, imposing statues. The statue of Ramses II at Karnak stands today and another sculpture, a massive bust of Ramses, was recovered from Abu Simple. The immense size of these works, though he never saw them in person, seems to have made a great impression on Tolkien, who had access to much information about ancient Egypt at Oxford if he desired it. Like the Egyptians the Numenoreans of Gondor built other works marvelous and strong, in the days of their power, at the Argonath, and at Aglarond, and at Erek, and in the circle of Angranost, which men called Isengard, they made the pinnacle of Orthon of unbreakable stone. The Argonath were not originally created by Isildur and Anarion, but rather were constructed by Menalcar, Regent 1240-1304, soon after his war against the Easterlings in 1248. Tolkien writes that Menalcar fortified the west shore of Anjuan as far as the inflow of the Limlight, and forbade any stranger to pass down the river beyond the Iman Mule. This seems a bit harsh, but the strangers seem not to have been men of Adanic blood. Rather, we learn in the peoples of Middle-earth that other men had long settled in the vales of Anjuan. The vague tradition preserved by the hobbits of the Shire was that they had dwelt once in lands by a great river, but long ago had left them, and found their way through or round high mountains, when they no longer felt at ease in their homes because of the multiplication of the big folk and of a shadow of fear that had fallen on the forest. This evidently reflects the troubles of Gondor in the earlier part of the Third Age. The increase in men was not the normal increase of those with whom they had lived in friendship, but the steady increase of invaders from the east, further south held in check by Gondor, but in the north beyond the bounds of the kingdom harassing the older Atanic inhabitants, and even in places occupying the forest and coming through it into the Anjuan Valley. The first hobbits entered Eridador around 1050, and it was not for another 200 years that Gondor would deal with the Easterlings, driving them back into ruin. The implication thus is that even Menalcar could not completely eradicate the Easterlings between Anjuan and Renner. It appears that some must have survived in southern Mirkwood near Dol Golder, which was not powerful enough to threaten Gondor but nonetheless could harbor some strength of Easterlings who might travel down the river. The fortifications of the west bank of Anjuan thus make sense, Although Tolkien had originally envisioned some troubles with the Northmen themselves still living in the Vales of Anjuan. But positioned south of the Anjuan forts as they were, the Argonath could not have been intended to hold back travelers. Rather, they symbolized the great power any strangers from the north would be rousing to anger should they pass so far southward without an invitation or permission. While the West Bank forts were manned the opportunity to procure such permission was easily available. Hence, it should be no wonder that when Aragorn himself passes between the Argonath he does not feel the fear and awe that the others exude. Although the power of ancient Gondor had passed its memory had not, and that power was a part of his heritage. The Argonath were thus a part of his heritage, and he passed them proud and erect, his hood, cast back, and his dark hair, blowing in the wind, a light, in his eyes, a king returning from exile to his own land. The Bridge of Askiliath. We know very little about this great bridge, but it seems to have been quite huge, a typical Numenorean work of Gondor. When Isildur and Anarion established the kingdom of Gondor they built three cities, Minas Anaur, Minas Ithil, and Askiliath. Askiliath was the chief city of the realm, 
and the Numenoreans built there a great bridge, upon which there were towers and houses of stone wonderful to behold, and tall ships came up out of the sea to the quays of the city. These towers and houses of stone are not described by Tolkien, and he seldom names them. But a few references can be found in the texts. In Unfinished Tales Menaldil says farewell to Isildur and his sons at the east gate of the bridge. One almost gets the impression that at this time the entire city of Askiliath must be contained on the bridge, but perhaps not. Isildur and Anarion had their thrones set side by side in the great hall of Askiliath. The placement and structure of the hall are not given, but it may be a part of the house of the kings, see below, and perhaps one of the chief structures of the bridge. The tower of the stone was destroyed in the kin strife, and so the master palantir which required more than one man to move was lost in the swift, deep waters of Anjuin. Gandalf referred to the Dome of Stars at Askiliath, where the stone rested, and presumably this was that portion of the tower where the palantir was kept implying perhaps that the tower was quite large. When Isildur left Gondor Unfinished Tales says there were few horses available in Askiliath, but there is no mention of whether stables existed on the bridge itself. It would seem, though, that if great towers and houses stood there, then the inhabitants may also have quartered their animals there, such as they had with them. In the days of Turan and Philaster, his queen, Beruthiel, lived in the king's house in Askiliath. The house is not stated to have been on the bridge, but it contained gardens, filled with tormented sculptures beneath cypresses and yews. It would be interesting indeed if the bridge of Askiliath were so large that it could contain a palace with gardens large enough to hold trees. The attack on Askiliath from Minas Morgul in 2475 resulted in the final destruction of the Great Bridge. The city had long since been only a shadow of itself. Many of its people died in the Great Plague of 1636, and King Tarander had removed the seat of the kings to Minas Honor in the aftermath. The stewards maintained garrisons in Askiliath to hold the bridge, but after 2475 it became less necessary to defend the city than it was to defend the bridges and fords. There can be no doubt that Askiliath experienced a period of growth at least in the early centuries of Gondor's existence, and the city even if confined to the bridge originally must have flowed out onto both shores of Anjuin. The river was quite wide, perhaps a mile wide, at the city's location, and the bridge would have contained many houses and towers. Its population should have numbered in the thousands, and perhaps fleets of ships sailed under it as far north as Caer Andrus. Of all the works of the Numenoreans in Middle-earth, the bridge of Askiliath must have been the greatest. The Twin Fortresses of Aglarond and Angranost There has been much debate concerning the purpose and origins of these two fortresses. At best we know that they were built by men of Numenorean race and that they figured prominently in the wars of the later Third Age. There is little enough written about the fortresses. In Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age Tolkien says, The chief city of Gondor was Askiliath, through the midst of which the great river flowed, and the Numenoreans built there a great bridge, upon which there were towers and houses of stone wonderful to behold, and tall ships came up out of the sea to the quays of the city. Other strong places they built also upon either hand, Minas Ithil, the Tower of the Rising Moon, eastward upon a shoulder of the Mountains of Shadow as a threat to mortar, and to the westward Minas Anaur, the Tower of the Setting Sun, at the feet of Mount Mindalwin, as a shield against the wild men of the Dales. In Minas Ithil was the house of Isildur, and in Minas Anar the house of Anarion, but they shared the realm between them and their thrones were set side by side in the great hall of Askiliath. These were the chief dwellings of the Numenoreans in Gondor, but other works marvelous and strong they built in the land in the days of their power, at the Argonath, and at Aglarond, and at Erek, and in the circle of Angranost, which men called Isengard, they made the pinnacle of Orthon of unbreakable stone. The days of their power could mean quite a few things. The Numenoreans assembled their greatest armies, Elrond tells us, during the days of the last alliance of elves and men. And yet Gondor reached the peak of its power during the days of Etanadar Alcaran, who lived more than 1,000 years after the overthrow of Sauron by the last alliance. 
it's unlikely that Tolkien envisioned the days of their power extending past the Gondorians' retreat from Mordor in 1636. The Great Plague so devastated their realm that they were no longer able to maintain the watch upon Sauron's realm afterward. And yet, Gondor weakened itself during the Kin Strife, which occurred some 200 years previously. We know that Turan and Philaster extended Gondor's control westward along the coasts of Middle-earth. He must have conquered the Anfilas, probably Andrast, and perhaps even Andwaith. Angranost and Aglarond would have provided him with valuable bases in that time, but they could also have been built to help control the gap of Kalinart Han. So it's probable that the fortresses were not built any later than circa 913, the end of Philaster's reign. After his day the ship kings were concerned with taking Umber and other parts of the Harad, so it's unlikely they would have needed any fortresses in the northern lands. In fact, since Philaster was himself the first of the ship kings, we may guess that he conducted his conquests from the sea rather than by land. So then what strategic value would either Angranost or Aglarond have held for the Numenoreans in the days of their power? From Gondor's founding until the overthrow of Sauron Mordor was indeed a threat to the western lands, but Appendix A in the Lord of the Rings says that Elendil and his sons believed that Sauron also had perished in the ruin of Numenor, so the threat they would have perceived was not one of Sauron's return, but rather of the presence of those of his servants who had survived his death in Numenor. However, if Angranost and Aglarond were intended to defend Kalinarthan against Mordor they were poorly positioned to do so. An enemy army could cross the entire province before reaching the fortresses. Anjuin would have been a better place to defend the region against attacks from the east, and in the Third Age the river was indeed fortified for just such a purpose. It's hardly likely that the Gondorians possessed a military lore superior to that of the Numenoreans. Yet Kalinarthan was a part of early Gondor. We know this from the survey of the realm Isildur is said to have made in the tradition of Isildur, given in the chapter Syrian and Eorl in Unfinished Tales. It is said that when Isildur returned from the War of the Last Alliance he remained for a time in Gondor, ordering the realm and instructing Maneldil his nephew, before he himself departed to take up the kingship of Arnur. With Maneldil and a company of trusted friends he made a journey about the borders of all the lands to which Gondor laid claim, and as they were returning from the northern bound to Anarion they came to the high hill that was then called Ilinar but was afterwards called Amon Anwar Hill of A. That was near to the center of the lands of Gondor. Isildur must have been in Kalinarthan if he returned to Anarion from the north. We also know that Sauron had at one time positioned an army in the lands east of Kalinarthan, for he is said to have burned the Entwives out of those regions, creating the Brown Lands, in an effort to slow the advance of the host of Gilgalad and Elendil. Could Anarion have built the fortresses at that time? It seems unlikely as they still would have served no purpose and the construction would have required many men and much time, of which Anarion is said to have had too few to withstand Sauron in any event. It seems logical that the Gwadawirim of Endwaith were the reason for the construction of these fortresses. These people were related to the men of Dunharrow, the wild men of the Dales in the lands to the south, and to other men who had accepted Elendil's rule in Arnur. For whatever reason Andwaith was not incorporated into either Arnor or Gondor and its peoples, hostile to the Numenoreans for centuries, were probably enemies of both realms. Thus, it would be logical for Isildur and Anarion to have built the fortresses during the first century their realm existed. The presence of a Numenorean force in Aglarond would have helped defend Kalinarthan against the men of Dunharrow, although it could only have represented a threat to them from the flank and perhaps was one reason that Isildur was able to conclude a peace with them. When they broke their oath to march with Gondor in war, the fortress would have helped convince them not to attack the Numenoreans from the rear. But what was so wondrous about these two fortresses? The fortifications themselves were not extensive. Angranost had its circle but the Great Wall of Aglarond was built late in the Third Age by the Rohirrim. Orthon was a wonder in its construction, being tall and so well built that even the earth crumbling power of the ants could not harm it. Isildur and Anarion, or their heirs, placed a palantir in Orthon, using the fortress to watch over the northern bounds of their realm. Aglarond really only had the glittering caves to mark it as something special. 
but it is perhaps significant that Gondor, and Rohan, never mind the caves despite the obviously rich mineral deposits there. The natural beauty of the caverns may not have been a shrine, but nonetheless must have inspired a sense of awe akin to that which Gimli and Legolas expressed when they saw the caverns for the first time. The Numenoreans may indeed have appreciated the special beauty of the caverns and elected never to alter them for fear of destroying one of the great wonders of Middle-earth. Taken together, Angranost and Aglarond represented a vivid memory of the power of Numenor. Even at the end of the Third Age they provided visitors with a majestic and sensational view even though the great power which raised them had long since retreated south beyond the White Mountains. Chapter 12, A Chronology for Tolkien's Four Ages The First Age dates were mostly taken from the War of the Jewels, the eleventh volume of the history of Middle-earth. Many of these events are uncertain and for the last 100 years or so things get very tangled and complex. I have two years for each of several events, such as the destruction of Arvernian by the Fionorians 534 and 538. A much more complete chronology for the First Age can be found at Parma Ambarnazzi, http colon slash slash www.unt.universityie.ac.at slash tilde a 9001168 slash web ok. The following chronology is retained from the original Parma and Orion for the sake of completeness. A few additions have been made for this edition. The first age lasted about 590 years. It is explicitly stated in at least one place that it lasted this long. The War of Wrath lasted from 545 to 587 and the elves spent three years building ships in which to sail to Valinor. We know that Elrose died in SA 442 at the age of 500, so he and Elrond, twins, were born in Fa 532. The following abbreviations are used, Fa 1st age SA 2nd age Ta 3rd age FO 4th age I's absolute years of the sun. Dating by age I's dash Fa 11 Fingolfin enters Hithlam. Fa 77 Fingolfin becomes High King of the Noldor in exile in Hithlam. Fa 2020 Merith Adir Thad. C. Fa 5151 About this time, Finrod establishes the kingdom of Nargo Throned. Fa 6060 Dager Eglareb. Fa 6565 Finrod rebuilds Eglarest and Brithambar. Fa 104 104 Turgon settles in Gondolin. Fa 260 260 Glaurung first appears and is wounded by Fingon and his archers. Fa 310 310 Finrod meets Beer and the first house of the Edain, the Beorians. Beer's people settle in Estelad. Fa 311 311 The Haladan enter Osirian but move north and settle in Dor Karan Thur. Dating by Age Eyes Dash. Fa 314 314 The Marakians enter Beleriand and settle in Estelad. C. Fa 315 315 Fingolfin sends messengers to welcome the Edain to Beleriand. Fa 365 365 Council of the Edain is held in Estelad. Many Marakians return to Eridador. Many Beorians migrate south. Fa 375 375 The Haladan are nearly destroyed by orcs. Haleth leads them to Estelad. C. Fa 380 380 About this time, the Haladan settle in the forest of Brethel. Fa 410 410 Finrod makes Boromir, great grandson of Beer, lord of Lajros. C. Fa 420 420 Fingolfin makes Hader lord of Dorlaman and most of the Marakians settle there. Fa 455 455 Dager Bragalach. Fingon becomes High King of the Noldor in exile. Many Marakians and Beorians flee Estelad and return to Eridador. Barahir becomes Lord of Lajros. Most of the Beorians flee to Dorlaman. C. Fa 457 457 About this time, the last of the Beorians flee Lajros and Barahir becomes an outlaw. C. Fa 460 460 About this time the swarthy men first enter Beleriand. 
The folk of Bor settle north of Himring and the folk of Ulfang settle in the Arjlian. Fa 473 473 near Naeth Arno Ediad. Turgan becomes High King of the Noldor in exile. Fa 474 474 Brithambar and Aglarist are taken. Serdan and Arinian settle on Balor. Fa 484 484 Turin flees Doriath. Fa 495 495 Battle of Tumhalad. Nargothrond is destroyed by Glaurung. Fa 499 499 Turin slays Glaurung and then himself. Fa 500 500 Morgoth frees Hurin. Hurin visits Bredel. Fa 504 504 Burin and Luthien pass away. C. Fa 506 506 Doriath destroyed by the Fionorians. Fa 510 510 Gondolin is destroyed. Arinian Gilgalad becomes High King of the Noldor in exile. Fa 532 532 Elrond and Elros are born in Arvernian. C. Fa 538 538 Arvernian destroyed by the Fionorians. Elrond and Elrose fostered by Mahler. Dating by Age Eyes Dash. Fa 545 545 The War of Wrath begins. Fa 587 587 Breaking of Thangaradrim. Elrond, and Elrose, present at the battle. Fa 590 590 Many Eldar leave Middle Earth. SA 1 591 Serdan establishes Myth London. Gilgalad establishes for Lund. Sealborn establishes Harlund. SA 32 622 Serdan's mariners take the Edain to the Isle of Elena, Numenor. SA 40 630 Latest probable date for founding of Ed Helyond. SA 442 1032 Elrose Tarminyatter dies in Numenor. SA 500-1090 By this time, many Sindar and Noldor have migrated eastward and Orifer and Amdur have probably established their kingdoms among the Sylvan Elves. SA 600-1190 Vienter the Numenorean sails to Middle-earth. Gilgalad arranges for him to meet with Edenic men from Eridador. SA 700-1290 Many Noldor and some Sindar settle in Eregion. SA 725-1290 1315 Vienter brings Alderion to Middle Earth. C.SA 750-1340 Ostinethel is founded. C.SA 750-1347-90-1380 Sometime during these years, Alderion builds the seasonal haven of Vinyalund, which will more than a thousand years later be known as London Dayer End. SA 882-1472 Gilgalad writes to Tarman Elder to ask him for aid against the growing darkness. C.SA 1000-1590 About this time, Sauron settles in Mordor and begins the building of the Barad Dur. SA 1075-1665 Numenor abandons Taraldarian's works in Middle-earth. C.SA 1200-1790 About this time, Gilgalad refuses to let Anator enter Linden. He sends emissaries to other elvish lands to warn the elves against befriending Anator. Anator settles in Eregion. Numenor changes its policies in Middle-earth and the Numenoreans begin to colonize Middle-earth. C.SA 1300-1890 For the next 200 years or so, some Eldar leave Eregion. Dating by Age Eyes Dash. SA 1520-90 Sauron leaves Eregion and returns to Mordor. The Gwadimerdain begin to forge the Great Rings of Power. SA 1590-2180 Celebrimber forges Vilya, Neria, and Nina. SA 1600-2190 Sauron forges the One and the Elves learn his true identity. Numenor begins to send reinforcements and supplies to Linden. The Gwadlo River is fortified. SA 1695-2285 Sauron invades Eridador. Gilgalad sends Elrond to Eregion with an army. 
SA 1697-2287 Saran destroys a region. Elrond retreats north to found Imladris. The west gate of Hazadum is closed. C.SA 1698-2288 Saran overruns Eridador and Ravanian. C.SA 1700-2298 Great Numenorean Navy under the command of Sir Yatta reaches Linden and Sauron is thrown back from the Lhuan. SA 1701-2291 with Numenor's help, Gilgalad defeats Sauron and drives him from Eridador. C.SA 1702-2292 Gilgalad holds the first White Council and names Elrond his viceroy in Eridador. C.SA 1800-2390 About this time, the Numenoreans begin to make conquests in Middle-earth. This may also be the time three Numenorean lords receive rings of power from Sauron. C.SA 1869-2459 Tarsir Yatan becomes king of Numenor and begins to oppress men in Middle-earth. C.SA 2280-2870 Umber is fortified by the Numenoreans. C.SA 2350-2940 Pelargur is established. C.SA 2540-3130 Kalmasil conquers large areas in 2737-3327 Middle-earth. C.SA 3145-3735 Farazan wages war against Sauron in Middle-earth. SA 3262-3852 Sauron taken to Numenor. Gilgalad begins to extend his power eastward from Linden. SA 3323910 Downfall of Numenor. Elendil and his sons establish Arnor and Gondor. SA 3429-4019 Sauron attacks Gondor. The last alliance of elves and men is formed by Gilgalad and Elendil. SA 3434-4024 Battle of Daggerlad. SA 3441-4031 Sauron battles Gilgalad and Elendil. End of the war. Mortar destroyed. Dating by Age Eyes Dash. Ta 1432 Sardan becomes Lord of Myth London and Linden. Isildur becomes High King in Gondor. Amroth becomes King of Lothlorien. Thranduil becomes King of Northern Greenwood the Great. Ta 2 4033 Isildur slain by orcs near Amon Lank. Ta 3 4034 Otar reaches Imladris. Ta 10 4041 Valandil becomes High King in Arnor. Ta 109 4150 Elrond marries Seal Brian. Ta 130 4171 Elodin and Elroer are born. Ta 241 4282 Arwen is born. Ta 249 4290 Valandil dies. Ta 490, 4521 The first Easterlings attack Gondor. Ta 652, 4893 Valandor, High King in Arnor, dies in battle, the only High King after Isildur to die a violent death. Ta 830, 5071 Turan and Philaster begins to extend Gondor's power along the coastlands. Ta 863, 5104 Arnor is divided into Arthedain, Cartolan, and Rudor. No more High Kings of the Dúnedain are proclaimed. Amlithe, King of Arthedain, moves to Fornost Urain. C. Ta 1531 A shadow falls on Greenwood and it becomes known thereafter as Mirkwood. C. Ta 1055081 About this time the history come to Middle Earth, landing at Myth London. Thranduil may at this time move his people north away from Dol Golder. The Harfoots begin to cross Hithalur. C. Ta 1155181 The Fayohides and Stoers migrate to Eridador. The Stoers settle in the Angle. C. Ta 1205231 Gondor reaches the height of its power. C. Ta 1305331 Ungmar is founded. Orcs begin to appear in the Hithalur, attacking the dwarves. 
many stores flee to Dunland or Anjuan. Ta 1356 5387 Rudor attacks Cartolan and Arthedain. Serdan leads or sends an army to Arthedain. Ta 1409 5440 Angmar invades Arthedain. Serdan and Elrond help end the invasion. Rudor ceases to exist. The last prince of Cartolan perishes. Arthedain absorbs what's left of Cartolan. Dating by age eyes dash. Ta 1605631 Marco and Blanco found a shire. Ta 1636 The Great Plague devastates Eridador and Gondor. See. Ta 1855881 Wayne riders enslave the Northmen. Some escape to the Vales of Anjuan and in time become the Eothead. Ta 1899-5930, Battle of the Camp. Ta 1974-6005, Angmar destroys Arthedain. Arvedui dies. Ta 1975-6006, Battle of Fornost Urain. End of Angmar. Ta 1977-6008, Fromgar leads the Eothead north. Ta 1986011 The Dwarves of Hazadum release the Balrog from its prison. Ta 1981 The Dwarves abandon Hazadum and many elves flee Lothlorien. Amroth dies and Nimrodal is lost. Edhelyond is finally abandoned by the elves. See. Ta 1985 6016 About this time, Sealborn and Galadriel take up the rule of Lorien. Mithrelas weds Imrazor the Numenorean in Belfalas. Ta 1999-6030 The dwarves of Durin's line settle in Erebor, under Thrain I. Ta 2060-6091 The watchful peace begins when Sauron withdraws from Dol Guldur to ruin. Ta 2210-6241 The dwarves abandon Erebor. Ta 2466491 Sauron returns to Dol Guldur and the watchful peace comes to an end. Ta 2463-6494 Galadriel forms the Second White Council. Ta 2510-6541 Battle of Parthcelebrant. Eorl leads the Eothead south to Gondorsaid. Rohan is founded. Ta 2596621 Thra re establishes his people in Erebor. Gur settles in Iman Ingrin. Ta 2758 The long winter begins. Rohan is invaded. Gondor is attacked. Ta 2776801 Smog attacks Erebor and Dale. Thra and his family escape. Many of Durin's folk settle in Iman Ingrin. Jirion of Dale's wife and young child escape to Esgarot. Ta 2799-6830 Battle of Nanja Hyrion. Azog slain. Ta 2851-6882 The White Council meets. Saruman urges caution. Ta 2931-6962 Birth of Aragorn II. Dating by age eyes dash. Ta 2941-6972 Thorin and company return to Erebor. Battle of the Five Armies. Balg slain. The White Council drives Sauron from Dol Guldur. Erebor is re-established by Dane. Ta 2944-6975 Bard re-establishes the Kingdom of Dale. Ta 2951-6985 Elrond reveals Aragorn's true identity to him. Aragorn meets and falls in love with Arwen. Ta 3017-7048 Aragorn brings Gollum to Thranduil. Ta 3019-7050 The War of the Ring. Sauron overthrown. Aragorn establishes the reunited kingdom and marries Arwen. Sealborn establishes the kingdom of East Lorien. Ta 3021-7052 Elrond, Galadriel, and Gandalf leave Middle-earth, 
taking Frodo and Bilbo with them. C.F.O. 17053 About this time, Legolas and Gimli lead part of their peoples to Gondor. F.O. 67058 Aragorn makes the Shire a free land. F.O. 117063 Mariadoc becomes master of Buckland. F.O. 137065 Peregrine becomes Thane of the Shire. F.O. 157067 Aragorn visits Anuminas. F.O. 217073 Samwise, Rose, and Eleanor visit Gondor. F.O. 317083 Aragorn adds the West March to the Shire. F.O. 347087 Fastard of Greenholm becomes first warden of the West March. F.O. 617113 Samwise sails over sea. F.O. 637115 Death of Eomer. F.O. 120 Death of Aragorn. Arwen returns to Lorien. Legolas and Gimli sail over sea. F.O. 121 7173 Death of Arwen in Lorien. F.O. 172 7224 Last notations made in the Thanes book by Fine Egil. C.F.O. 220 7272 Death of Eldorion, son of Aragorn and Arwen. Chapter 13 Sources used for research. Following are the primary sources I use in my research. I do not by any means rely solely on one source for my research into historical or archaeological questions, although Malcolm Todd has a pretty good reputation for writing books that appeal to mass audiences. Books such as those by Phonestat and Foster are really secondary sources and they contain mistakes, but they are good reference volumes nonetheless without which I would be hopelessly lost on some issues. Carpenter, Humphrey Ed. Dot, the Letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1981. ISBN 0-395-31555-7 Phone Stad, Karen Win the Atlas of Middle-Earth, Revised Edition, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1991. ISBN 0-395-53516-6 Foster, Robert The Complete Guide to Middle-Earth, Ballantine, 1978. ISBN 0-345-27520-9 Hammond, Wayne G. and Christina Skull J.R.R. .R. Tolkien, Artist and Illustrator, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1995. ISBN 0-395-74816-X Todd, Malcolm Everyday Life of the Barbarians, Goths, Franks, and Vandals, Dorset Press, 1972. ISBN 0-88029-176-1 Tolkien, Christopher, ed., The History of Middle-Earth Vol. I, The Book of Lost Tales, Part 1, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1984. ISBN 0-395-35439-0 Vol. 2, The Book of Lost Tales, Part 2, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1984. ISBN 0-395-36614-3 Vol. 3, The Lays of Beleriand, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1985. ISBN 0-395-39429-5 Vol. V, The Lost Road and Other Writings, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1987. ISBN 0-395-45519-7 Vol. X, Morgoth's Ring, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1993. ISBN 0-395-68092-1 Vol. 12, The Peoples of Middle-Earth, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1996. ISBN 0 395 4 Vol. 6, The Return of the Shadow, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1988. ISBN 0-395-49863-5 Vol. 9, Sauron Defeated, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1992. ISBN 0-395-60649-7 Vol. 4, The Shaping of Middle-Earth, Houghton Mifflin Company, 
1986. ISBN 0-395-42501-8 vol. 7, The Treason of Isengard, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1989. ISBN 0-395-51562-9 vol. 11, The War of the Jewels, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1994. ISBN 0-395-71041-3 vol. 8, The War of the Ring, Houghton Mifflin Company, 1990. ISBN 0-395-56008-X Tolkien, John Ronald Rule The Annotated Hobbit, Douglas Anderson, ed. Houghton Mifflin Company, 1988 The Fellowship of the Ring, 2nd ed. Houghton Mifflin Company, 1993 ISBN 0-395-48931-8 The Return of the King, 2nd ed. Houghton Mifflin Company, 1993. ISBN 0-395-48930-X The Tolkien Reader, Ballantine Books, 1966. The Road Goes Ever On, with Donald Swan, Ballantine, 1967. The Silmarillion, Christopher Tolkien, ed. Houghton Mifflin Company, 1977. ISBN 0-395-25730-1 The Two Towers, 2nd ed., Houghton Mifflin Company, 1993. ISBN 0-395-48933-4 Unfinished Tales, Christopher Tolkien, ed., Houghton Mifflin Company, 1980. ISBN 0-395-29917-9 Shippy, T.A. The Road to Middle-Earth, Acacia Press Incorporated, 1992. ISBN 0-261-10275-3 Appendix A, New Information Orcs. Since I first published the revised Parma and Orion, I've been contacted by several people who have pointed out a great blunder for me concerning the appearance of orcs. I unwittingly omitted what is perhaps the best known and certainly most controversial description for Orcs J.R.R. Tolkien ever wrote. How could I possibly have done such a thing? Well, we all make mistakes. At the time when I first wrote the essays for Parma and Orion my knowledge of Tolkien's world was less than what it is today. I had not yet acquired a copy of Tolkien's letters, and so did not have access to a great deal of material. When I revised the essays in 1998, I was in a state of transition in my personal life and dealing with many conflicts. So I overlooked some important information. It may also be that, for some reason now long forgotten, I may have felt the passage too controversial for inclusion. Such a decision, if I made it, would have been incorrect. In 1958 J.R.R., Tolkien reviewed a preliminary script for a proposed film adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. Based on his acerbic response to the script, most fans are pleased that movie was never made. Tolkien wrote a letter to Forrest J. Ackerman in which he provided many corrections and complaints. The one point concerning orcs has become fixed in Tolkien Arcana and its exclusion from even the revised edition of Parma and Orion is inexcusable. On the other hand, once I'd posted the website, altering it was out of the question. I have finally decided to include the citation here in a new appendix, which causes the least disruption to the design of Parma and Orion. In letter 210, Tolkien wrote 19. Why does Z put beaks and feathers on orcs? Dot. Z stands for Morton Grady Zimmerman, the first person ever to have written a screenplay based on Tolkien's work. The orcs, Tolkien continues a little further on, are definitely stated to be corruptions of the human form seen in elves and men. They are, or were, squat, broad, flat-nosed, sallow-skinned, with wide mouths and slant eyes, in fact degraded and repulsive versions of the, to Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. Much has been made of this citation. Some people have gone so far as to call Tolkien a racist, alleging he was implying the orcs were to be equated with Asian peoples. He is careful to say, however, 
that the orcs were degraded and repulsive versions of those Mongol peoples who would be least attractive to European sensibilities. Some people have suggested Tolkien may have been referring to the Huns, who left an indelible mark in the Western European psyche. Whether the orcs are intended to be degraded and repulsive versions of Huns is a mystery we cannot resolve, but it is clear that Tolkien felt a Mongoloid base was necessary for orcish appearance. Not because he equated Asians with evil, or thought them ugly. But because he needed a human model which, when distorted beyond realistic appearance, might appear monstrous and corrupted. In fact, many Asian cultures represent demons and evil gods in a similar fashion. I feel Tolkien's choice was inspired by a broad understanding of mythology, and not by racism. Everyone has questions about J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth Where did Aragorn's people live? What was life like in Bree? Did Balrogs have wings? Did Balrogs fly? What is the nature of magic in Tolkien's Middle Earth? Some researchers just make up their facts and tell you what they think Middle Earth should be like. Tolkien fans on the web know that Michael Martinez takes the time to read all the books. Turgan at Theonaring.net says, he has a chatty, opinionated, and engaging style that makes you feel like you've pulled up a chair to his table at a pub. Another review writes, if you, are fascinated by Middle-Earth's, incredibly detailed pseudo-history, this book is a must-have.